Okay, so the recording has started. So I'm going to take you back to the actual redesign instance here. Move this over. And so I'm, I'm logged into USAS. So you'll see that it is a URL here. So basically, um, a URL set up with your data. So when that time comes to import, it's importing all of your data from Classic into the redesign. And so it's going to be now in what we call grid-based formats, or what you're going to see. So it's in a database. Um, and so no more trying to memorize function keys and things like that in Classic. Um, so a lot of the things, the way that some of these programs like purchase orders is set up is very similar to what you saw in USAS Web. So, you know, we tried to emulate a lot of those same features and then obviously adding more advanced features on. So um, going in here, when I first log in, it's taking me to what's called the home screen. And so it's showing me um, my district name here and the person that's logged in. So the menu that you're seeing up here is, which is what we'll really get into here. Your menu will look different from my menu. I've got all powers that be on here, so you're not going to be seeing all of these different options. But I wanted to show you some of these because these are things that your ITC will have access to that will help you create roles or fields or user accounts, things that um, you may not necessarily um, want access to, but they will. So I just wanted to show you some of those features that you may not see, but your ITC has access to. Um, over off to the right-hand side, you're going to see a month, and I, forgive me that my data is old. It's, it's over, well over a year old here. Um, but it's showing me my current processing month. So we call it the current processing period. So it's January of 2018. So that's the current period that I'm in in USAS right now. Um, we're going to talk about posting periods here in a little bit. Um, and then going over here off to the left, you're going to see uh, my home screen. And what I have set up is I have favorite reports selected. And when I first log in, I'm going to see my favorites right away. So if you're one that runs a cash summary report, which is the FinSum report, um, you're, it, you've got access to it right from your home screen. So if that's something where you run it every morning, you can go right from your home screen click on the cash summary report here and produce that report. So I will get into reports later. That's going to be the, almost like the last thing I talk about because that's probably going to take the longest to go through that. Um, but we'll touch upon all of this. But you can basically customize your home screen here. So when I click on home, it's going to display this and basically customize it with the reports that you want to see. Now if I wanted to see all the reports that are out there, I could click on show all reports, and it's going to show me all the reports that are out there. So obviously we don't have time to go through all of these, but I'll, hit, I'll touch upon a couple. Um, ones that you guys probably use most often, your financial detail report, your FinSum, which is the cash summary, and things like that. Um, so we will definitely touch upon all of that. Now some of you may be looking at this and saying, okay, you know, I I get that there's new names for these reports, but what is it replacing in Classic? Well, we do have um, documentation out there, and we even have a printable um, document that you can print out that shows you the redesign report name, the Classic report name, and a description. And I'm just going to show you that real quick. I'm going to go back up to my Report Manager tab. And I'm in the USAS R documentation is where I'm at right now. And I'm under reports in the report manager tab. So up at the top here, I can go in. And you'll see right there when I'm kind of scanning through here, there are a ton of template reports that we have created out there. Um, but I'm going to click on the SSDT template reports here. And it takes me to an actual listing in the actual documentation with the name of the report, the classic counterpart, and a definition of the report. 
So, and then in here, I can click on one of these links to take me to a bit more detail about that report and what it's, and it's options in it, and maybe a sample um, output file from it. Um, but if I wanted a printable crosswalk, is what we call this, up here on the bold here, there's a printable crosswalk of this, and I can click here to get to that, and it's going to allow me to print out a printable crosswalk of all the different reports that you can keep on hand so that when you need to, you know, reference, okay, I want to run a cash summary, what, or I want to run a fin sum, what do I need to run? Um, it'll tell you here that the fin sum is your cash summary report. So, so just, uh, you know, a few little tidbits and just things that we have out there just to make things a little bit easier when you want to reference that information. Okay, so going back to the instance here. So the first thing I want to talk about is are, are your menu options that you're seeing up at the top. So right now we're in the home, and again, if I want to go back to my favorites, I can click on show only favorites just to see the ones that I use all the time. And then our next option here is core. And so when I click on core here, um, these are the main proce uh, core processing options. So accounts would be one of them. So this is where you're going to see your cash account, um, your expenditure budget accounts, your revenue accounts um, in a grid style format. So I'm going to pull up the actual accounts and explain uh, what you're seeing here. There's tabbed information first. We have buttons up here that allow you to go to those specific options. So the fund is just by fund. So if all of your uh, 200 funds, even though you may have several uh, special cost centers for those, special cost centers beginning with a nine, if you wanted to see the total amount of just that 200 fund, I could click on here and view that information. So um, you may not be in the fund option as much as you are in the rest of these. So if I click on cash, that's kind of where I want to settle on here for now and just talk about um, what you're seeing on the grid because this is all going to be grid-based information now. And I did, you know, make my screen bigger so I might be doing a lot more scrolling left to right in order for you guys to see everything here. But one of my favorite things about these grids is they are customizable. So you can go in and create what you want on this grid. So meaning you can put um, select from columns underneath this more option, and those columns will then be displayed on the grid. So you may not like the default columns that appear, so you may go into the more option here and change this and say, you know what, I really don't want um, the initial cash. I don't need that. So I can go down to that option and uncheck it, and it will no longer appear on my grid. And if there's something where, that I do want to, maybe I want to see, is this, an, is this fund a valid fund? Has it, you know, is AOS still recognizing it as a valid fund? I can click on the account valid and add that column to here, and then I can see if there are any invalid funds. Um, active, inactive, if I wanted to get rid of that status, I could remove the active status as well, and it will no longer appear in my grid. So what I did is I set up my grid to show, you know, the, the basic stuff that I think about when I'm in account screen looking at a cash account or when I'm in USAF web looking at a cash account. I want my fund. I want my special cost center. I want the description. I want to know is this active or inactive. And then I've got these main fields. What was my initial cash? What did I receive in so far for the year? What was expended? What's my fund balance? minus my encumbrances, and I'm going to slide this over, to give me my unencumbered balance or remaining balance. So those are things that I have set up in my grid that I can easily access this information and see it right away when I click on the cash tab. So within here, then, I can filter. And so that's my next favorite part, is I can go into a specific um, area and just filter and say, I just want to see all my 200 funds. So I go into what we call the filter row, and then I click on that, and it's going to take me to all, my two, to all of my 200 funds. So it bypasses everything else before that, and it 
will not include anything after that, and it's just going to give me the 200s. So um, these are test files, so a lot of the description information is going to look kind of weird. Um, it uses the default description, old blue book um, information, um, but um, also another thing I can do is I can say I just want to see my 200 funds that are active. So this is something a little different, is that it's not yes or no, it's true or false. So I can say I want my active ones. Well, that would be true. And so I can even just type in a T and it's just going to filter. Then I don't even have to type in the entire word true. And it's going to show me just my active 200 funds. Um, and then what's nice from here is when I'm using this filter row, I can go in and generate a quick report from it, just like that. So this will take what is on my grid. So Anything that by, you know, that's over here that I can't see, that will still get included. So it's looking at all of my columns that I have selected, included in my grid. And then from there, um, it's going to, whatever my filtered information is, I can generate a quick report of that. So when I click on report, it's going to bring up a little pop-up box. And from here, I can pick on the format that I want. And you're going to see this generate report option a lot. You're going to see it on all the grids. You're going to see it when you go to your home screen, that generate reports right there with all your favorite reports. You're also going to see it in the report manager when we get into there to show you all of the SSDT reports. You can generate a report from there. So what's nice is this just gives you what's currently what you have selected in your grid. So in here, what's nice is I can choose whatever format I want. So if I want it to be in PDF format, I can do that. Um, if I want it in an Excel format, I have different options here. Um, there's an Excel option here, and I could put it in that way. I could put it in a CSV format. So there's lots of different formats that you can use. So if you guys are spreadsheet lovers, you know, this is great because you've got these options for spreadsheets. Um, also, there's a page size orientation. Um, it defaults to the name of the report. So this was our FinSum. Um, it's now um, called Cash Account Summary Report. Or I'm sorry, it, it would be like a FinSum. We're pulling it from the grid. And then there's also options here, a summary report, which even summarizes it even more. This may not be very useful for what we're trying to do here, because that would just show me one lump sum of just the 200 funds. I want them all broken down by special cost center, so I would leave this unchecked. And then this is a brand new feature that we just added on our last release, and it's called Show Report Options. And that's basically um, the options page on your classic reports. So if you selected to choose, you know, options page to see what did I select during this, um, that's the same thing here. So if I click on Show Report Options, it's going to allow me then to generate this report. Um, so that will be included. That will be page one showing me what did I include on this report, which will be my information on the grids. And then I click on generate report and it's going to generate a PDF file. Now one other thing in here as well is I can save this report. So if this is uh, filtered information that I am going to use constantly, I can go in and name this and say student, student activity 200 funds and click on save report and what that's going to do is it saves the report in all my filtered information and it basically created a custom report for me that I can go in and access at any time. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this so you can, well, we can see it later when we get to the report manager and it tells me that this report has been saved. And then again, that didn't generate it, that just saved it under the report manager grid. But if I just wanted to generate this, I can then click on generate report. And I've got it, um, I, I use Chrome, and so everything that I do, um, it prompts me to where I want to put this, so I'm just going to put it in my downloads folder click on save, and then when I pull that up, the first thing I'm going to see are my report options because I checkmarked that box. I wanted to see my parameters, what I selected, 
And then underneath that then is what I had on my grid. So I did portrait. I probably should have done landscape. Um, but um, you'll see that included all of my 200 funds in all of the columns that I had on my grid. So this is a real quick, easy way to generate a report from the grids. So I'm going to show you other ways to generate reports, but some of you may find that this is pretty nice to be able to do it straight from a grid, depending on what I filtered in there. Okay. So going back to the account filtering here, I'm sorry, the filter row, I should say, you're going to see this type of setup in all the different grids. So you're going to see the ability to go into more and add columns. You're going to see the ability to generate reports. I don't think we'll have time to talk about advanced query today, but that's something else where you can even do in more of an advanced query. And then you've got this filter row that you're going to see in all the grids. And Lori's going to show you the same thing. It'll be the same type of format there in payroll as well. And so we have um, documentation and all the shortcuts that can be entered in here. Um, so I could say I want to do something where I can click on X to get rid of my filters here, and if I want to say I want to see any received amounts greater than 100,000, I could do the greater than or less than sign and put that information in, and it's going to filter that. So I could do a range. So if I was in um, like the purchase order grid and I wanted to do a date range, I could put in from this date dot dot to this date and it's just going to bring me those or display those purchase orders on the grid within that date range. So lots of different things that you can do to filter to get information. So you were so used to in Classic, just you only had certain fields that would show in USAS Web, and you'd have to run reports to get all that stuff um, in order to see it. Now you can get it right from the grids. So that's really nice. Um, same thing with appropriation, um, expenditure, and revenue. So we do have those tabs as well. So that's all broken out into these different tabs. Um, and again, I go in and I customize my grid. And one thing I didn't show you is that I can move my columns around. So I could go over here, and I wanted to show you this on purpose, because one thing I added underneath more is my forecast line number. So I can go in here and kind of move this over and say, I want my line number to come before my description. And you could filter on the line number and say, I just want to see, you know, forecast like the accounts that make up my forecast line number 1.010. And I could put that in here, and it's just going to show me those. So that's another cool thing that you really you were not able to do in, in USAS Web. Um, so in here, again, once you move your columns around and you add the columns you want, it'll stay that way. So if you log out or you go to a different menu, come back in, that information will still be there intact the same way that you left it. You customized it, so it's going to stay that way. Um, there are also ways to sort your um, uh, columns that are in here. So if I wanted to click on line here and resource this by the forecast line number, I could do that, maybe not on that one. Maybe I'll try fund here, or receipt code. I can go in and resort it. Now that doesn't stick. If you go log out or go to a different menu option and come back in here, it's going to default back to the default sorting. But resequencing your columns, adding and removing columns, that will stay that way. So in here, I want to go further into what you're seeing then, because right now I'm just showing you the grid. So if you're like, well, yeah, well, now I want to go in and take a look at one of these revenue accounts, I could go in and actually click on one of these. So we've got a view option, and we have an edit option, and there's a delete, but obviously there is security information in here. I have admin access. Um, so my deletes showing, you will have group manager or standard type of access. You won't see that delete um, option unless it's an account that you just created and did nothing to. Then you'd be able to delete that account. Um, so in here, I'm going to go ahead and just click on one of these. I don't know if I have any money in here, but we'll try it. Okay, great. And because I had to make my screen so large, I have to reformat my screens here, you shouldn't have to do that. 
So in here, it's showing me this revenue account, and we tried to set it up very similar to USAS Web. You've got you know, your revenue account code up here. You have your account description information. Um, so you can use cross-reference codes. If you guys are cross-reference code users, those should be imported in. Um, and then you have like your forecast line number, and then you have your amounts. So you got fiscal, month, and calendar all showing here, kind of the same order that we had in Classic. And then there's also custom fields down here. So if you wanted to create a custom field, you're tracking something that's just specific to your district, you can create a custom field and that field, that new field will appear in here. Or you can take one of these custom fields and change the descriptions. So if you want to use code one for something, we can go in and edit code one and make it whatever name you want and then you can use that field in here. Um, just to scroll back up to the top, you're going to see some options when you actually view an account, um, edit. Edit will obviously have the same restrictions that I had in Classic. You can go in and edit the description or go in and add a start or stop date, things like that. Um, we do have the ability to clone accounts just like you could in Classic. And then the one thing that is uh, different from what you saw in Classic, in Classic you could have gone in um, modified a revenue account and add um, and added um, additions or deductions in order to change your receivable figure. Um, in here, what we call them is budget adjustments. So in here, if I click on this button, it's going to bring it up and it's going to show me. I'm going to pull this over so you can see both. So it's showing me on my gap import, or I'm sorry, on my initial import my initial amount that was imported in, and my gap um, amount as well. So there's my $35,000 and my $35,000. If I wanted to come in here and add another $1,000 to this, I can click on Create, and I can put in whatever the date, and I'm in January, so I'm going to put that in here. And once I hit Tab here, it knows it can't override my initial. It's an adjustment. I already have an initial amount. So it changes that transaction type to adjustment. I'm doing a positive $1,000. So I'm just going to put in $1,000. And then I can also put in a description. Um, if this is approved, um, I can put in the board minute notes or who did it or who approved it. So I can just say increase by 1000 And then when I click on post, it's going to add this adjustment onto my um, tracking of like kind of like an audit trail of what I've done to that account. And you'll also notice that it increased my adjustments field. So by $1,000, thus increasing my receivable amount. And the same thing I would have to do, you notice that it does not automatically adjust my gap original. So I would have to go back in and there's another option in here to do um, an actual gap um, adjustment, and then it will do the same thing and update my gap amount. I just kind of wanted to touch upon that with accounts. Um, any questions um, regarding the account codes or account code grids or any of those features? Okay. I'm going to go back underneath core. And I'm just going to touch upon a couple of these others, but I think I'll go into posting periods and show you that. So bank accounts, so uh, bank accounts is basically allowing you to enter in if you've got um, uh, your, your finances in two different separate banks, you can track that information in here. And when you create disbursements, you can choose the bank account that that's coming out of. So that's something kind of new um, that we didn't have in Classic. Uh, delivery addresses. Right now, when data gets imported in, it's importing all of your delivery addresses on your requisitions or purchase orders. So it's pulling all of that in, and they're all going to be displayed in this delivery address. So you could have a lot coming in here, but you're only using your elementary, your high school address, maybe if you have a warehouse, transportation. So in here, you can go in and check mark the ones that you use, and so there might only be four out of the 50 that are sitting there, and um, 
From there then, when you go to create a requisition or a purchase order, and you go to the delivery address information, you click on the drop down, and it's going to show those four addresses you can choose from. Um, operational units, the same as OPU Edit in Classic. The organization is um, your USA Con. A lot of those flags and stuff in Classic went away because we, we didn't need that in the redesign. Um, but obviously your organization address information and things like that are going to be found underneath here. So your um, federal EIN state, your central office square footage, and the ITC um, that you're associated with. So all the Neoman is going to be in there. And then that information then is stored in there. And then some of that information will get pulled out, like at fiscal year end, when you're running the report to um, your USA EMS EDT, your district uh, maintenance information, it's going to pull the information from here. So not a lot of information in here, but you do have the ability to go in and edit that. Um, projects would be your project to date information that you had in Classic, and then vendors, obviously. Um, so all of your vendor information is going to get imported over. Um, so during the test imports, um, an import log is created, and the ITC can take a look at that and scan through it. And there's a summarized um, box at the bottom of the log that they can go in and take a look at that and see if there were some things that didn't get carried over, like your, and it's, it's always the vendor. Um, if there's a vendor that had an odd um, state abbreviation, something didn't jive, and maybe for some reason it still said Ohio and not OH, then it will go in then and let you know that um, during the test import so that we can go back into Classic and clean that vendor up and put in the correct um, abbreviation for the state. And then from there, once they do another test import, it'll import over correctly. So again, the importance of doing test imports are huge and all the IT have been doing a really good job of getting those test imports, um, getting their district's data tested out first. Um, the posting periods is something kind of is something new for the redesign, and so right away you see a column or a row with that's highlighted green, and this is telling me the current period that I'm in. So right now I am in January, and so that should match what's showing here. So it is open, and it is current. Now the difference between that, so current means if I go in and look up. Um, a particular cash account, and I'm looking at the amounts. It's my whatever month is set as my current, so January is my current. It's showing me everything. Um, the month to date information is January. So if I had um, January current and I also had February open, I could go in and process like future purchase orders. Because February is open, um, but my cr um, current month is still January. So if I looked up an account and looked at, you know, the requisition amounts or current encumbrances, it's reflecting up through uh, January because that's my current period. So what you guys are going to do when you're done with the month, you're going to go in here and close that month. And you're also going to go in and open up the new month. So that's part of the month and closing procedures. So if you wanted to keep the month open then, uh, for some reason you can. Um, but I think right now at first, I think districts are more comfortable just saying, okay, I'm closing January and then I'm opening up February. I'm working out of February. I close February. I go and work in March. So. But those that have gotten comfortable with it may leave um, January open and, and, and make February current and then go back in January and, you know, run reports and things like that. Um, so the posting periods is something a, a little bit to get used to, uh, but once you get a pretty good handle, it, it really works. This is kind of like your adjust in classic. So you're closing out, you're opening up a new month. So that pretty much takes care of core.
transactions is what you guys are going to be using um, most often. So this is the main expenditure and receipt information is in here. So obviously I don't have time to go through all of this, but just to show you, there is a requisition. The requisition legacy is going away. It's in the old USAS web format, but we are going to be removing that at the end of June. So that will not be an option after that. Um, so requisitions, then purchase orders, and then AP invoices. You notice that that says legacy. That's still in the old um, USAS web format as well, but we have been working on that, and I think that's slated for within the next few releases, we're going to have it in a grid format just like everything else. We're trying to get everything to look the same in here. So there were a couple programs that we still had to, had to use legacy, but we are you know, migrating that over to a grid-based format. So AP invoices is definitely one that's going to be, that's the next one that's going to change over to a grid-based. So you're going from requisition to purchase order to AP invoices, and then from there, there is a payables option. So that's something new for you guys that you're not used to. Um, that's like invoice list in the database. So that's going to go out there and show you all of the invoices, outstanding invoices that are sitting out there waiting for you to make a payment against. So it's going to go out there and show you, and there's two different formats in here. Let me take you to that here. So right now, I'm in the vendor tab, payables by vendor. And so it's basically showing me all the outstanding invoices for that vendor. So I could have three or four different purchase orders and invoices against Lion's Gym, it's showing me the total amount. Same thing with the next one, um, Pamela. I may have you know, five different purchase orders and invoices against her, but this is just showing me the total amount. If I wanted the detail and to see all the purchase orders and invoice stuff, um, I could click on the detail tab, and it's just gonna pull it over now and it's gonna show me what it looks like with that information. So I get a little more detail. What was the account tied to it? Stuff like that. And again, I can go in, start moving things around and customizing my grid. So in this case, um, <coughs> Lion's Gym here, I've got, looks like two items. So I look at the POs here, the invoices are the same, so it might be item one and two. So if I just wanted to generate a check for just this one, I can click on Lions Gym. I can either click on both of these, or if I'm just paying for the one item right now, I can just click on that one. Or if I know I'm paying for both of these, I can either click on both here, or I can go back to the Vendor tab and click on Lions Gym, and that's the same thing. And then from there, I can click on Post Selected, and it will create the disbursement, what we call it now, instead of a check. So it's going to create that disbursement, takes me to the disbursement grid, and then from there, I can go in, assign a check number to it, and print off that check using my third-party vendor. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have all the time to show you all the steps of the expenditure process, but I just wanted to focus on the payables right now because I know that's different. So we go requisitions, purchase orders, to our invoicing. We go to payables to look and see what's out there. And then once I post those payables, it's a disbursement. And I can go to the disbursement screen then to see all that information. So I'm just going to click on that just to show you what's all out there. So you've got your disbursements for your warrant checks. You have your disbursements for your refund checks. And you also have your disbursements for anything um, that's getting posted through payroll. So that's another option I'm going to just talk about is underneath transaction. There is a pending transaction option that allow you then to go in and once that payroll is posted in from uh, payroll into USAS, that pending transaction option will then allow you to take that and post that payroll, it's kind of like auto post, and post that payroll into um, USAS. And it doesn't require a purchase order, it just takes the whole thing, and obviously it, you, know, you can assign a check number to it if you want to, if it's electronic, you don't have to, um, but all of your different disbursement types 
are listed right here. So if you wanted to, again, using the grid, go in and look at something, you could go to the payroll, and just find the payroll ones. You can type in P or payroll up at the type field, and it will just show you those. Um, so in here, when you go in and do your invoicing, and you go to payables and you post that, there is this show printable option. And when you select that, it's going to show you all of the disbursements that have been made but do not have a check number assigned to it. So you're not assigning the check number when you're doing the payable. You're assigning your check numbers in the disbursement grid. It's been expended. When you posted that payable, it expended it. But at this point then, you need to assign a check number because you need to generate checks for this. And so to find all of those that don't have a check number yet, I can do show printable. And unfortunately, I don't have one right now. But it would show me that. I click on that. Click on generate print file. And I can assign a check number to it. It also gives me the ability. I'll go ahead and show you one that already has it here. Pick on this one here. So I'll click on generate print file. And you'll notice then it shows me the next available check number. I can put in what my next check number is. Obviously, this one's already been assigned a check number. Um, but if this was one that wasn't, I could put that in here. I have sorting options. I can um, sort it by different things, just like you could in Classic. Um, a lot of people um, at first, um, when it came to electronic type of checks, they still wanted a check number assigned to it. So you do have that option. If this is an electronic check, you do have an option to check mark this, and it will assign a check number to it. And then you have your output files, XML or PDF. So if you're um, an Edge or an ABM is your printing, uh, uh, printing software, you can click on that, click on Generate, and it will produce that XML file and save it to a folder somewhere on your computer and then you can pull that into that third party. Other things that you're going to see in transactions is I kind of took you, you know, through uh, very fast the expenditure process, but um, also you have receipts and refunds in here. So you can generate a receipt. What I love, love, love about receipts is that I go in and create a receipt. I'll just go ahead and click on it. I go in and create a receipt, and I post that receipt. And I look at it. So I'm going to take you through create here. You can see that. And so purchase orders, requisitions, they all look similar. It's the same type of box here. Um, there is a way to track your requisition or your transaction numbers. Um, we have a screen that will allow you to put in a beginning number and that will just start um, incrementing from there. So if I've already got that set up, I don't have to put in a receipt number here. It already knows what my next available one is. And I tab over to my date. So I put in whatever um, date I want here, um, received from. So same thing that you got when you did receipts in um, Classic and actual description of the entire receipt as a whole, so I can put stuff in there. And then when I go down here to my items, here's where I can go in and start entering my information. So again, what you're seeing here on this line, you're going to see the same type of format when you're doing a purchase order or a requisition or a refund. So if I just want to say um, cafeteria, lunch, student. And again, I can choose receipts or reduction of expenditures, just like classic. Let's say it's $100. And then here, I can go in and start filtering. I know it's an 006 fund, so I can start typing 006, and it's going to bring up everything within there. So I can get you know, pretty detailed and say, I know it starts, the revenue account starts with a 15. And you can see that it just keeps filtering. So it's going to show you the account code and the description. Now, we've had a lot of people requesting, I want to see the balance, too, especially on the requisition and purchase order side. What's my remaining balance in that account? So with that, instead of using this, you can use this option here. And this is our new search. We just put this out in the last release. So I could go ahead again and put in my 006 and narrow it down, and it's, again, going to show me 
And also it's going to show me, you know, what I had receded in so far or what, what's been receded in so far and what percentage has been uh, received. So I can just click on, you know, whatever I want and it's going to pull that in here. Now one thing I'm going to click on that once again. You also have a way to find things by description or by cross-reference code too. So we've had some very happy um, requisition users when we um, added this on here. Um, they were so used to seeing that in USAS Web, and so we added that feature on here as well. And that's, you know, another nice thing about this is we get enough um, inquiries, requests from people um, about enhancements, depending on how many times we receive that request, we add it to the software. So it's not something, you know, if it's something that we feel, you know, we get a lot of feedback, people saying this is really important, then we want to make sure that that's in here. Um, we've also created um, some uh, state software advisory committee, and within that committee, it's representatives from districts um, that, have, that started on the redesign and ITC fiscal staff and some ITC directors. They're on this committee, and we meet every quarter and talk about the status of the redesign, where everyone's at, and at the same time, we also have breakout working groups. We have a prioritization working group that uh, uh, members of that, commit, of that um, committee will get together once a month and the head of our USAS and payroll um, software programs will get together through a, a webinar and they'll discuss what's uh, the next prioritization, what's the next most important feature that you need. Um, and so they will talk about those and decide how to prioritize these enhancements, um, or if there's a problem with the software, what they need to do to work that out. So that's in a very helpful group. Two other groups we have is we have a reports working group. Um, and so those, again, are, are a few members of, that, um, of the council that get together in this committee, and they'll go in and create report definitions, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and within those report definitions, then, we're going to post those publicly. Um, we just started um, with this committee, and we're going to post those publicly out there for you guys to use, for the end user. So if there is like a really cool budget summary, which is a BUDSUM report, that you want to use, you're, you, you can go and pull that report definition that some other person has created and you can import that in and use that budget summary report. So our last group is called Support Documentation and Training. And so we get together um, and discuss how to improve the software, um, training, ITC training, um, and also the newsletter that we send out every month. So if you guys aren't getting the newsletter, um, let Neoman know, and we, we've got a distribution list that you can check mark on the newsletter. And what happens then is you get added to our distribution list, and I make sure that you get the newsletter the next month. We, we are trying to issue those every month. And what's nice about the newsletters is that it gives you like important information around that time frame. So our April newsletter is going to be devoted to budgeting steps. How do I budget? Um, and also some little side blurbs, like did you know type of just helpful hints and tips and tricks. Um, so and other useful information that's related to the redesign. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and one other thing while I'm in here showing you this um, is you're going to see this create new and this close option here. So if I've got, you know, everything entered in for this receipt and I know I've got 12 more to do after this, I'm going to click on Create New, and what happens is, is after I save this, it's going to keep the window open and allow me to create my next receipt. So you'll see that it's open. If I know I'm just doing one receipt and I just want it to close out of here and not have to click on the X after I post it, I can click on the Close option here. I have to unselect that first. And then once I get through creating the receipt and I click on Save, it closes me out of this box entirely. So just some, and it stays that way for your whole run. So that's, that's pretty nice. Okay. So let me, 
while I'm in here on the grid, just other things that you'll see. Like I said, you're going to see this and um, all the different um, transaction programs. Is one thing I was telling you at the beginning of receipts, which I love, is I just went in and added that receipt and realized I put in the wrong description or I put in the wrong date. I put in January 10th and it should have been January 15th. Um, what's great about this is I just can go in and edit and it brings it back up. I put in the wrong account. I'm still in January processing. I could go in and make those changes and save it. You couldn't do that in USAS Web and for those of you that use the old RC form, <laughs> Classic, you definitely couldn't do it in there. Um, or, yeah, RC, not RC form, RC proc, RC proc. Um, so, again, um, just some real easy things that you can do to make changes um, to um, your transactions. We all know it's, we're not perfect when we're entering that stuff, and it's easy to make a mistake, and you can go back in and edit it and not have to jump through all these hoops to do that. So we've got receipts, we've got refunds. So with, with the refunds, you can do a refund with check. We have the trans, uh, transfers and advances. So this is ACMOD's fund to fund transfer option. This is lovely because you don't have to have a purchase order and a check to create a transfer anymore. It's a very quick, easy um, process. I'm just going to open up the box, but I won't create one here um, just to show you the different options that are in here because it's that easy. You're basically saying, do I want to do a transfer in advance? How much? What's the date? What's my description? I'm advancing money from the 001 fund to my cafeteria fund. And then based on what you selected up here, it's going to filter down and just show you the advance accounts or the transfer accounts. I click on save and I'm done. It makes the changes on the back end. It moves the money from those accounts, and it's nice and clean, and I didn't need a PO and a check to complete it. Also, we have a distributions error correction. This is another kind of miscellaneous option in here. Um, and that's like doing a correcting entry, um, whether you're doing a, re a positive and negative reduction of expenditure, or whether you went into ACMODS, um, expense supplies distribution option. So this is the replacement for this, but it's so much better. I click on create. I put in my positive and negative amounts to make my adjustments, and I click on save and I'm done. So very quick and easy way, and, it's, and it's, it will see if, you know, if you put in $100 as a positive amount, um, and then put in a negative $80 and try to post this, it's not going to let you. It's like, wait a minute, you're moving, you're doing a, an adjustment here. It has to be the same amount. So it's smart enough to know that whatever you take out of one has the same amount has to go into another. So that is basically the majority of the options that you see in underneath transaction. Now, I saved a really cool feature at the end here of this menu, and that's the activity ledger query. This is like OINC in a database. So for those of you, and I know you won't admit it, but for those of you that are big OINC users, um, this will allow you to do that in here. So you could go in and you'll just kind of looking at the screen, you kind of just have to sit back and say, okay, what's all in here? Um, so it gives me a date, it gives me the type of transaction I'm looking at. Is it an invoice, a purchase order, a receipt, a refund, a transfer? You can go in and filter on those. Um, I can filter by a vendor, a vendor name, a purchase order. So I can say I just want to see all the transactions against a specific PO. I can go in and select that. So I can scroll down, we have everything scrolling here. So I can go down and look at this, and I'm just going to pick on one of these. I'm going to pick on the Dasher Gymnasium 311765. So I can go up to the PO and say, I want 311765, and I put an equal sign in front of it because I just want just that purchase order information to show up here. And so within here, 
It's showing me all my purchase orders, and right, in, <clears throat> right away I know that I've got you know, several different things going on here. I've got invoice numbers, I've got check numbers. So I can go in and sort this by the date. These are all the same date. Maybe I want to sort it by the type. I can click on type and resort it. And then maybe after type, I want to sort by PO item number. I can hold down my shift key and click on my mouse, and it's going to do a sort within a sort. So first by type, and then by PO item. And so, but I can see all the information about that purchase order, invoices, and disbursements that have been done against it for each line item. So it is kind of like Oink in a browser. So um, again, I can generate reports then based on what I saw and create a, re a quick report out of this. So I can add and remove things. If I never am going to go in and look up refunds, I can get rid of that. So lots of different things you can do with Activity Ledger. Any questions about the transaction menu? So I think the only other thing I did not hit was pending transactions. Um, and that, I kind of explained that a little bit earlier. That's stuff that's coming over from payroll. So when a payroll is posted on the payroll side, there's an option to post it to you fast then. It shows up in pending transactions. I do not have any right now in here, unfortunately, in these test files. But basically, I would see, oh, I do. Um, so in here, awesome, Lori must have done this. Um, so she posted one in payroll, and now I have that in here, and I can go in and view this information first by clicking on edit, and it's going to bring up all my payroll information, so, and then all of the items that pertain to that payroll, and when I click on post then, it's going to bring up, let me click on that here, I think it brings up a pop-up box, there we go, and it asks me, is this an electronic type of posting, so obviously if you don't send, you don't take your check to the bank to post it to the, you know, to move the money from the payroll clearance account to your warrant account, then you can uncheck it, you can uncheck it if you do. Otherwise, the default is electronic, which I believe most districts are doing, an electronic transfer of the money. Um, the date and the actual bank account that you want that. So that's where I was talking about those bank accounts before. And then you basically click on post. It will post the disbursement. There's no purchase order that you're assigning. It's going straight from pending to a check. So it's going to go, to go to the disbursement. So you go into the disbursement grid, and that was one of those types that we saw, payroll. And then from there then, um, if you wanted to assign a check number to it, you can. Otherwise, you can leave it go, because then it's an electronic type of transaction, um, and it's out there, and it posts all those expenditures then to those salary accounts, just like the payroll option in auto post. So I knew I was going to spend a little more time on transactions. That and reports are the two I'm going to really um, go into more detail about. These other options that you're just seeing in here, just so you know what all is currently available in USAS are, um, we do have a budgeting module that allow you to go in and create scenarios. And I do have one here just to show you. Um, so I'm basically creating a scenario for all of my budgets for the next fiscal year. So I'm setting them all up in here, and we do have a step-by-step. -step. And like I said, this is something I'm going to, well, one thing that I don't think I told you guys is that we also have Friday webinars with the ITC fiscal staff. We do these, we're trying to do them once, one payroll one and one USAS one a month. So we have a webinar with ITC fiscal staff and show them new features, enhancements to the software, um, different processing like next week, I'm going to go through the budgeting process with them. So that way they feel more comfortable, get a better handle on it, and then they can pass that information on to you guys and train you guys on this stuff. So, um, so we, we are trying to constantly be in communication with the ITCs so they can feel more comfortable with the software. So in here, the budgeting will be set up. There are spreadsheets built within this application that will pull in 
um, whatever you filter those accounts for. If you just want to focus on the high school accounts, you could filter in for high school, enter in those next year proposed amounts, and then once those are what we call a promoted, um, we have what we call a proposed amounts grid, and I apologize, but I don't think I have anything in here. Oh, well, here's one. That's a good example. Um, and so in here then, it's going to show all of those accounts that I just created on that spreadsheet with my proposed amounts. So this $40 is showing here, and it's also showing on my proposed amounts on that actual account if I went and looked up that particular account. So in here, I can, this is kind of like a working grid, so I can go in and if I didn't mean to budget to this account, I can click on X to delete it. I can go in and modify it, the wrong amount, I can edit it. I can go in and create additional ones and it will allow me to put in the account code in the next year proposed amount. And then this grid sits out here until I'm ready to apply it to um, the next fiscal year. And so then it will become initial budget. So kind of about a little quick and, uh, um, description about what this budgeting module does. Uh, we do have a periodic menu, and the periodic menu is basically stuff that you're doing at certain times of the year. So we do have a cash reconciliation option, which for those of you that, you, that do use USA EMS EDT, this is so much better. Um, it allows you to go in, and I've got one out here already for the month of January. And I'm just going to click on it so that you can see it. I'm going to go in and edit. And what you're going to see are all the different things I can add. So if I want my um, bank balance here, I would go down here, enter the information in, click on Add, and it displays it up in this box. And it gives me my total gross depository balances. Cash and transit to the bank, I'd have to put that in, as well as my outstanding checks. Any adjustments, investments, petty cash, so a lot of that, you know, same stuff that you see in USAM CDT. And then down at the bottom here, it totals that all up, and what I entered in here is in the total balances, my actual system balances here, those have to match. So um, those match, I can go ahead and click on save. Um, if they don't match, I'll get a warning saying these are not in balance. Um, <clears throat> but what I love about this, is that once I'm done posting that, so that's so much easier than going through that old scrolling program in um, Classic, is I can take January's then and clone it into February. And obviously I'm changing my amounts, but if you have a bunch of, you know, your bank information here and all of your investment information, you know, you've got three or four or five different lines, all of that gets cloned over to the new month. So you just have to go in and change the amounts and you're good. So it does make it much faster. And what's nice too is you have a grid getting created of all your cash recs. So you can quick go back to six months ago and look at your cash rec from that month. And we do have um, <coughs> USA CERT. Um, the old USA CERT reports are out here, the appropriation resolution and the certification, your amended certificate and your cert valve, they're underneath here. Um, we have our fiscal year end type of uh, programs in here, civil proceedings, the federal assistance detail and summary records, um, the building profile information. So all of that was out there last year because we did have people on the first wave that closed out live in redesign. Um, the five-year forecast. So this is another thing that right now um, districts can use. And this is a really nice tool because it just basically brings up all the different amounts on the forecast. <clears throat> and then from there, it's going to have two different options. It's going to have a CSV option and it's going to have an Excel option. And so the CSV will just bring it up and, and create a, generate a file in CSV format. The Excel will create an Excel um, spreadsheet, and when you click on that spreadsheet, it pulls you right into the SSDT forecast. So you're already in their forecast, our SSDT forecast format, and then from there, make any changes you need to, add your, you know, your 
future year information, and you've got your forecast that you can then upload into EMIS FFE. So that's another one that we'll be going through and discussing as well, so, but a great feature. You don't have to use this, but it is a nice um, option in here. Um, we have extracts, um, EMIS extract that you'll do at fiscal year end, a GAP, that's the web GAP, the GAP EXP extract that you had in Classic, and positive pay. So we do have positive pay set up. Underneath system, like I said, you guys may not see um, a lot of the options underneath system based on your um, access level. So, but um, with that though being said, I mean, there are ways to create custom fields. We were talking about that earlier. Creating custom roles. I mean, you guys are used just to the standard USAS access, standard payroll, you know, read only, rec only. Well, you can also create a custom role and say, I want this particular person just to be able to do receipts. Want them to have access to purchase orders and invoices and checks. So we can create a role and you know the ITC will obviously help you with that to create that role so that particular user when they log in, they're just going to see underneath transactions the receipt menu or their receipt option and that's it. So those are just things that can be done now in this new software. Um, users are all the different user accounts. Those will all get imported in from Classic. So whatever account you're using now in Classic, you can use that same account and you'll have the same access. If you're a standard user, you'll have standard access in there as well. Um, uh, utilities, account filters, those, those are the two big, so big ones I wanted to show you guys, just talk about. Everything else is more um, just stuff that the ITC would have to you know, look at more than you guys would have to be concerned with. Um, utilities, we do have an account filters. That is the USA security. So that allows you to go in and create account filters. Now all the ones that you had from Classic will get carried over. So those are all out there. If you need to make a changes to them, you can. Um, and then you can run reports based off of these account filters. We also have our account change. So that's the ACT change option in Classic. Automatic reconciliation. This is basically where you go in and set up to automatically reconcile your warrant check. So it's really a one-time setup option. Once you're done with that, when you go into the disbursements grid, then you can use the auto rec option and that's just like the auto rec option in Classic, so very similar. Um, this proration utility is something new. We just had this out here within the last couple uh, releases and um, it allows you to prorate information such as like your work comp figures. So that's uh, an option that you can use for the old work comp program if you guys use that. That wasn't an SSDT uh, report. It came from another ITC, but I know a lot of um, people throughout the state use that. So we have created something similar to that using this proration utility. And the USPS integration just means that you've got that turned on, that you're talking to payroll. So um, that's something that the ITC will turn on when you get imported in, and that allows you also to pull stuff from that pending transaction underneath the transaction menu. So you probably won't ever have to be concerned with all of this test connection stuff that's underneath here. So that's stuff you really don't need to be worried about, but that's what it's um, tied to, just showing, hey, we are connected with payroll, because payroll and USAS will talk to each other regarding accounts and things like that. So what I really want to focus on um, next is within, because I'm, I'm trying to cut myself off at 2.30, so Lori's got um, even amount of time to show you payroll, is the report manager, because I know this is probably the biggest topic of discussion that we've had with those districts that are currently on the redesign because there's, it is, there's so much um, out there. But when I click on the report manager, it's giving me all of the reports, whether they're reports that I have created or that the SSP has out there that are called template reports. So in here, I've got all these different report options here and anything that says SSDT means it is a template report that the SSDT created. Now you can't go in and modify that, but you can go in 
or you can't go in and modify the existing report and make changes to the SSDT version, but you can go in and pull up, like the budget summary report, which is the replacement for BudSum. I can go in and this is called open the report definition. I can open it up, tweak and make some changes, add a field, remove a field on the report, and then that becomes my custom report. So um, the reports that you're used to in classic, like your budget summary, if there were fields you never used or you always wanted the field in there but it was never in there, you can go into this report definition and open it up and you can make changes. Now, what you'll find yourself doing is having your ITC help you with this or they'll be you know, probably creating some of these reports for you until you get a, you know, feel more comfortable with the software. Um, but they can go in and right now this is showing me these are all of the different fields that are on the report. Well, I don't do future encumbrances. I can just get rid of that field altogether by Xing off of that and that future encumbrance field will not appear on my report. I can go in and filter it and put specific things in here. Um, you probably won't use this as much because you'll be filtering here when you generate the report. Um, so if you're wanting to customize a report, your ITC will probably help, Neoman will probably help you um, first. And then from there, once you get comfortable, you'll be going in here and messing around with this as well. We had one of our districts here. Um, I, we also uh, work with Nawaka here at SSDT. We're both housed in the same building. And one of our smaller districts that just went on, he sent a message to us the other day and said, I feel like a kid in the candy store. And then he confessed, I am a nerd. And uh, he said, but I'm loving going in here and playing around with these reports and getting more comfortable with them. So it was, it was pretty funny, so it was good to hear that, that he was happy with it. Um, what you guys are going to find yourself doing is when you go, I'm going to go back up to Report Manager again. And you're going to filter on the report that you want. So if I pick on the cash summary, I can go in and start typing in, and I haven't showed you guys this yet, percent signs or wild cards in here. And I can go in and enter in a name and I can surround it with percent signs and it's going to bring up all of the reports. And I know that these are SSDT reports because it tells me that created by, if I went in and created my own report, it would have my username in there. Um, so these are all the ones that have the word cash in it. And the thin sum is our cash summary. So again, just to go in and generate what's already out there without having to go in and customize it, I would click on this Generate and Download Report option. So when I click on that, it's going to bring up the report with all the query parameters. So if you kind of think about your FinSum report and you're on the first screen of the FinSum, you've got all those different options and on the second screen too to put in account filters and things like that. So I want to talk about what you're seeing on this box because you'll be using a lot of the different options in here. First off, we have a save and recall. So this is kind of like the save sets you had in Classic. So in here by default, it's going to pull up your most recent entry. So just like in Classic, I run a cash a thin sum report on the 006 fund, I go back in the next day, it's going to remember what I did the day before and still have those filters. Same thing here. I ran an 006 um, for the 006 fund um, earlier this morning, now I'm coming in here and it saves my most recent entries. Um, another thing you could do is you could select default, that'll go back to the default settings, or if you've got a lot of different cash summary reports that you want to keep track of, one for cafeteria, one for the athletic director, and so on, you can create based on the filters here and save those. So in this situation, if I wanted everything for my um, cafeteria, fund, I could put in the filter for the cafeteria fund and I can say I just want to see active accounts. I'm going to mark that as a T and then what happens is, is I go in here and click on the blank here and it allows me then to put in lunchroom. 
and then I click on this save option here and it's going to save that report. I just basically created a save set and when I click on my down arrow, I'm going to see all of my save sets underneath the most recent. So I could wind up having a couple dozen out there if I wanted to. Um, but then I can go in and pull that save set up whenever I need it. <clears throat> and then from there, I can generate that report. Um, another thing too is if you know you have quite a few and you're not using this one anymore, pull it up and click on delete to get rid of it. Um, so that's one way of creating save sets, creating multiple reports for that same you know cash summary report. So the query parameters again will allow you to go in and put in specific things. So if I'm just talking about one fund or one specific fund special cost center. Like for this one, I've got my, my, my fund special cost center, I just want it for the cafeteria. If I wanted all my 200 funds, I could put in 200 here and it's going to pull up all of them. If I just want, I can get very detailed here and say I just want ones that begin with 5, 7 and then a percent sign and it's just going to pull up those specific ones. Um, also, this filter name, this is tied to our account filters that were up there underneath utilities. We had those account filters. So if I've got a report that I want to generate that's got a lot of like inclusions and exclusions, I'm thinking of like a budget summer report, which is your old bud sum, and I want to exclude 100 and 200 object codes, but I want to include everything else just for my O2 OPU, I can create an account filter underneath utilities for all of that, and then I can apply that account filter here. So whatever name I gave that account filter, I would enter it in here. I can't, I don't have one right now. Um, but when I generate the report, it's for all of that. And I would save it. If it's something where, you know, it's just for that building, for just everything but, um, salaries and benefits, I can go in and enter in a name here and save that report, make it a save set, and bring it up whenever I want to. So, so lots of different things that, you know, you can do. We can schedule jobs. Jobs can be, we've got this job scheduler down here that we have one district here at Nawaka that he wants a report generated, uh, I think a FIN financial detail, a FIN debt report. Um, on Monday mornings for like 10 different users. And so we help set up and scheduled a job to run at 6 o'clock in the morning every Monday with that person's specific account filters. And this job scheduler will allow us then to send it. So we have to create this cron expression, which your, your ITC will help you with that. It's pretty fun actually because there's a ton of different cron expression applications out there on the web and you can basically pick, I want Monday at 6 a.m., you know, every Monday and then it creates this little cron expression that you copy and paste in here. You send the output file to that person. So we set up, you know, 10 different FinSum reports to these people and they get a FinSum every Monday morning at 6 o'clock. So lots of different possibilities with that. Okay, so that's um, basically the reports in a nutshell. We do have a couple other options on the grid. Um, editing, you know, if you name the report, you created one and you wanted to edit it um, and change the name, you can by clicking on this. You can tag reports and you can tag the reports you created and the SSDT ones. So if you know this is a certain report that you run at fiscal year end time, I could go in and edit this and say fiscal year end and click on save and you'll see this tag over here and then I can filter on those tags and just pull up those reports that are for that specific time period or whatever you're using it for. Um, you have the option of deleting reports that you have created. So obviously, all these SSDT ones, you aren't able to delete, but any that you've created off of the templates, 
um, you can delete those in case you aren't using those anymore. So you don't get a lot of clutter, you know, going on with your grid. Um, you can download a report definition. So if you created this pretty sweet bud-led report and you want to brag and give it to your um, fellow treasurer, you can go in and create that bud-led with all of your account filters and stuff, and then you can download that report definition and save it. So I could basically go in and click on this, and you'll notice this when it gets a little um, nerdy here, um, where save as type is RPD JSON. Don't change any of that. You can, you know, change the file name and say, you know, my masterpiece, and click on save. And then what happens then is you can then attach that in an email to your fellow treasurer. They can go in underneath this import option and import the report in, and. Um, then they have your version of that report with all of those account filters or all those different settings that you had applied to that report. So pretty sweet. So you can share reports um, with others that are using the redesign. They don't have to be in your building or at your district. They can be other treasurers in a nearby county and you can share reports with them. Um, another thing that you can do as well, I'm going to um, get rid of this filter. Take me back to, and it's just on reports that you have created, um, is you can share these reports. So if there's a certain budget report that you um, have created for um, some requisition users, you can go in and click on the share option and share that report with that role. And so what happens then is when you check mark that and click on save, what happens is when that person goes in and logs in, they're going to see your report out there, and then they can run that report. So that obviously is within your district. So, um, so the report definition part is you can use that within or share it with people outside of your district, but this is the one that you're going to share with certain roles within your district. Okay, I want to leave a few minutes for questions here. Um, does anyone have any questions? Do you have the Ohio Checkbook uh, program? That's a great question. Um, we are working on that right now, actually. Um, I know they're doing testing and stuff, so I'm not sure if it's going to be on the next release or if it's going to be on the one after that, but um, that is coming. <laughs> Any other questions? What a requisition looks like. Can you show us what a requisition looks like? Yes. I'll go ahead and go back into transactions and click on requisitions here. And like I said, right now with requisitions, so this is the grid. Um, so it's, it looks the same as all those other ones. So when I click on, um, I'm just going to view one here so you can see what it looks like. I know this is very um, weird data here, but it's just scramble data that we have in our database. And so in here, you'll see the different options. So when a person goes in to create a requisition, it takes them right to the requisition number. Now we do not have it a capability to auto increment right now, but that's coming pretty soon. Um, but we can narrow it down for them to use certain requisition um, prefixes. So if you want them to be able to see just requisitions with their initials. Um, in the user, uh, when you set up, when you look at their user account, you can put in like MRD, and then those are the only requisitions they're going to see. So basically like your, you know, read-only or rec-only access that they had in Classic. So you've got the requisition number, the date, the vendor. Again, you can start typing in the vendor or you can click on the drop down to find or filter for a vendor. Um, the description, this is just like the generic description. Um, the delivery address information, so you can click on that to pull in what building. Um, and then down here is where you're going to go in and start adding your item information. 
And so you're basically putting in the quantity, unit, description, the price, and the um, charges, and you can split. I know because I'm just viewing a requisition, you don't see it right now, but when you're going and actually creating one, there's a split option that allows you to split the price and the quantity. So you can still do that just like you did in Classic. And then you've got your total down here. So again, if I wanted to go in and um, print this, I could go in and check mark a bunch of these, ones that I did today, I could filter on that, all that I did today, and click on the top box and select them all, or I can select them one by one, and I've got, you know, obviously the option to convert it to a PO, and I also have the print option here, and I can do XML or PDF, so I'm just going to show you what the PDF looks like. It's going to pull up that requisition in that, oh, i got to save it first. in that PDF format in case they want a hard copy of this, of this requisition. Any other questions? Is it possible to batch upload receipts or bulk import receipts? Uh, yes. Um, there is a way through that pending transaction option I was talking about. We'd have to set up the spreadsheet, the CSV file with specific headers. We haven't had a district ask about that yet, so that's something that I would have to test. But I believe as long as we have the right headers, you can go into the pending transaction then, and there is an import option right here that allow you then to choose that file and post that. And that should be able to mass um, post receipts. I just don't think we have, we haven't had anybody ask that yet, and I don't think I have that fully documented yet either in the manuals, but it is something that's out there. Anybody else? A lot of stuff to know, huh? <laughs> E-School Mall integration? Yes, we've had that as well. Somebody, I think, has asked about that. So I'm not sure if it's integrated yet or if they've discussed it, but I know it's been, I believe it's, it's one of those vendors that we have integration with. I'm just not 100% if they went ahead and used it or not. So that's something I'd have to check on. One other thing I just wanted to talk about is our, you know, our documentation, which I kind of showed you where that stuff was at, like all the different reports to get more familiar with that. But with our USSR and payroll USPSR documentation, we do have down here, um, when I look at the USSR user manual, we have an appendix that has <clears throat> a bunch of different how-tos. And we are going to be enhancing this. You know, we just have a few things out there, but it does provide some step-by-steps on, you know, how to do certain things in the software. And uh, most importantly, these pre-data extract procedures before importing the stuff that the ITC and the district need to look at. And then after importing, especially doing a test import, um, to follow the post-import steps because it gives you all the different things that you should do to set them up and to set up a district and all the balancing reports that should be run. So, um, so all that, that's a, a good guide for the ITC um, and the district to look at that stuff and make sure that everything's good. So we've got, so like I said, we keep adding things to the manuals, creating links and stuff to the user guides. So. Um, but that's kind of, you know, where we're at right now with, with the uh, documentation. Any other questions about USAS? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to transfer it over to Lori, and she'll get started with payroll. So I'm going to have to make her the presenter here. So give us a couple minutes to make the switch. Okay. We're just going to take a quick break to also, like five All or right. ten minutes to us. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Lori, I'm going to make you presenter. Okay. Okay, so right now I I can see your screen. You see my screen? Perfect. Perfect. And we got the recorder on, so we're good there. Yeah, so I think we'll just wait until they come back. I think he said he wanted to make about a or to have about a ten minute break. So we'll just hang okay. tight. Yep, that's fine. That that's fine. Yep. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh one thing that you probably want to do is make your spot your font larger. I had to he asked me to to make that bigger so that they could see it better. The Make yeah, the like screen bigger so this is like a plus. Control, like a control plus, yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Better? Can you see it better? <laughs> I, I can. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm sitting here in my mind trying to figure out exactly how I want to go about this so I can show them as much as I can. So right. I think we've yeah. got, it, got it in my mind. So. <laughs> Well, I'm going to leave the recording on here, and then so we don't have to turn that back on because I'm afraid that might make two different videos. So I'll just go yeah, ahead we don't and mute myself. Do right, right. So I'll just go ahead and mute myself, and and we'll see you okay. after. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Wait for Brian to come back on, and we'll be going from there. Perfect.
Okay, you guys there? Hi, Brian. Yep, we're here. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> uh, this is Lori Miller. I'll be doing the payroll portion of this demonstration. Um, is everybody back, Brian? We're all set to go? I think so, yes. Okay. All right, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually go over all of these uh, menu, the tab menu options, and you'll notice it looks very similar to Use As. Uh, we try to make things more consistent and make it a little bit more user friendly. So again, you can see just like Michelle had said in Use As, we have this home button, and when I go to the home button, I can see any reports that are actually out there under the report manager. If I go out, if I wanted favor reports like Michelle had shown earlier, I would just um, mark the ones that I want my, it to be my favorites. And then if I'm back at the home page, I can actually then see all of my favorite reports. If I want to show them all, I just go to the show all reports again. And you'll notice all of these reports are showing on here are what we call temple reports. So the temple reports are basically reports that are out there that maybe the SSDT created or another user created or you as, as a user can create. And then when you see this on your home page, those are all of those temple reports. We have other reports that are called canned reports, and I'll kind of show you that when we get to the reports tabs. Um, so that's pretty much the home page. Then we have the core option. Under the core option, there are a lot of different categories. Um, our first category is like the ACH destination. And if I click on that, the ACH destination is kind of like the routing screen in Classic. So um, when, when the, the data is imported for the district, if the district uses the routing screen in Classic right now, the data with the bank, the bank information, the bank name, and the routing number will pull over. Now, if they have a direct deposit set up with routing information and in there, that data will pull in, but there won't be any uh, description, no bank name, because there is no bank name on the deduction records. So the district or the ITC may have to do some cleaning up in order to get that data in there. But you can see if I hit click the create option, it just allows me to put in a routing number and then a description. So basically like the bank name. So if you get an employee that has a bank that you currently do not have on your AC destination screen, you would have to add that in in order for that employee to be able to have a direct deposit go to that bank. Another option under the core is the ACH source code. The ACH source code, and for districts, this probably isn't going to be anything that you really know too much about. Normally, the ITC set this up, and it's in classic, it's called the DER maintenance screen. And what it is, it's like the, the setup information for the, the header information on your direct deposit records. So the, again, this is something that imports in when, uh, when, when Classic is imported in or migrated in. And um, the only time anything would ever really have to be created would be is if, the, if the district changes banks for their direct deposits or maybe they do HSA direct deposits. Again, if they would have to happen to be changing banks, new ACH source records would more than likely need to be created. And I'll just pull up the record so you can see what it looks like. This is like the header record, the DER maintenance or the header record information for your direct deposit for your HSAs. And again, the districts normally don't have to contend with this unless the ITC decides, hey, we want to make the district responsible, make them start doing it. It's up to the, you know, the ITC and the district if the district wants to. But again, it's something that really isn't going to have to be uh, done very often, only if uh, banking is being changed. Then we have what we call adjustments. The adjustments option covers a wide range of things. Um, in the past, if a district is doing an adjustment for possibly, say, retirement hours or retirement days or ODJFS weeks, that was always done on the attendance screen. 
We don't do it in the redesign anymore through a tenant screen. All of that is done through an adjustment journal, and this is where that takes place. It all takes place in this adjustment screen. If I click this Create option, you can see, I'll click this Type feature, and it tells me anything that I can make adjustments to. I can make adjustments to health insurance, moving expenses, and all of those are the features in Classic on the Federal 001 deduction record. Those are those, are those uh, fields that are on there. We can make adjustments to all of them in here on this adjustment screen. You can make adjustments to total growth, taxable growth, just like you do in Classic on the deduction record. You would have to make the adjustment on here. Uh, amounts with how additional withholding amounts, all of those, any type of adjustment that you possibly make on like a deduction record or a tenant's record, those are going to be made through this adjustment screen. Here's our ODJFS weeks, days, hours, those are the things I was talking about before. Your EMIS attendance, EMI, EMIS absence data, again, that's going to be made in the adjustment journal. Um, our next option is going to be the attendance option. The attendance option, again, it's kind of like if you use the USPS web feature, we do have this mass add an option, and we do have mass add in Classic where you can actually go in and add multiple days. Um, if you wanted just to create an, an individual record, you could click the create option. You would find your employee, so I'm just going to find an employee. And anytime you're wanting to find an employee under the employee number or employee name, you just have to type in a few characters of the first or last name, and then any occurrence of that name is going to show up in this drop down. So then I can go ahead and select which employee I'm wanting to add the attendance record for. And you'll notice that I already pulled up the compensation record that goes with this attendance information. So obviously, that has the, um, the leave applied to this, this position. Then I have to put in the activity date, or I can use this calendar. If I use the calendar, I just click on it, I could click the date. If I wanted to just manually enter it, I could just put in the date. And then you'll notice length the, the absence type, the unit, and the category are already defaulted to absence or to one absence daily and sick. If I needed to change that, I can do that. I'll just go into the length. Uh, let's see, I'll just do 0.5. And then let's say it's for an absence, and it's for uh, maybe it's for personal leave instead. I'll click personal. And you'll notice we have the subcategory appointment type. The pay date, just like in Classic, will get pay stamped when the payroll actually processes. If you have a substitute and you're doing an attendance entry and you, you're using the substitute for Classic, you want it to maybe put the teacher they're subbing for, we still have that option in here. You can do that. Now, you'll notice also we have a posting option, just like in Classic in the attendance screen. You have the capability, if you were doing attendance entries and you wanted to post a future or post a current, you could set that up beforehand. And, and that way, when you enter the, save the attendance entry, it's going to post the data to future, just like it does in Classic. But since I'm doing an absence, obviously I'm not going to be posting to future. But I'm going to go ahead. I could save this record. If I needed to add more than one record for this employee, I could copy the row. Or, and what I can do, I could actually go in and find another employee. Maybe, uh, let me find Catherine Workman. I could do the same thing. Enter the information, copy it, add a new employee. Once I get all the information added, let me just act, get rid of this one. You'll notice we have X's over here. I'm going to go ahead and save this, these two records, and then, oh, I got it. Oh, hold on. See, and it gave me an error, which is really good, because it's telling me I don't have an activity date entered in for Catherine, and I don't. So if I go in and put the activity date in, now I can click Save, and it should save both of those records. 
and you'll be able to see on the grid those records are out there. Now, like Michelle had talked about the grid, you can see um, we have all these different options. And again, the same thing applies just like in USAS. If I wanted more things or less things on my grid, I could just go to more and select what I don't want or unselect what I don't want or select more that I do want. And we have that same feature in classic or in classic in the redesign, just like in USAS, where you can actually create a report off of this grid. So again, you can do a lot of things similar that you can do in USAS. Um, our other option for attendance is this mass add feature. And what we can do with mass add is we can go in and again, we would find our employee. And then I would have to put in the length. So let's just say it's one day of absence this time. The unit and the category are already defaulted. I can change those if I want to, just using a drop down. If I wanted to put a subcategory in, I could do that because, that, and again, that's a feature that's in classic. If I wanted to select an appointment tab, I can do that. You don't need to. Um, I don't have to put a pay date in. I can put a start date and end date, or I can just go down to the calendar and I can choose some dates that I want to put in as the absence days. Once I do that, I'm going to click the create option. Oh, hold on. Oh, I must have more than, all right, let me, let me pick some different days here. Let me unselect these. Oh, let me clear them. I'm going to clear them and start over. I'll pick some days that hopefully I don't have selected for him. Okay. And create those days. Yeah, now it's working. Okay, and you'll notice in this mass add option, again, we have that posting mode option. We could post to future or post to current, just as we do in, in classic. If I go back to the grid, you can see I, all of those days that I had added got added for him on the grid. You can see that. There's one other option that we can use for um, attendance or and pay importing. It's just like we have in Classic. It's the USP importing option. So a lot of times districts use a third-party vendor uh, for, you know, for uh, their attendance or their absence information. And then they get a spreadsheet from them in the correct format that we have to have uh, for, you, for payroll processing. And then you can actually import that data by going out to the utilities menu. And we have this attendance absence import option. And then here you would go in and you would choose your file. So like if you save your file on your desktop or in some folder, you could, you could go in and choose that file. And then if you have the location code information that you use that, on your spreadsheet, you would have to go in and tell the, tell the system, is it by the building I rent or is it the building department code? If you don't use anything with the location, you can just leave it as none. Then we have the post to uh, payroll processing options. Just like USP importing classic, you could post data to future or post data to current. If you're not doing any posting at all, you could just leave it as none. Um, if you're importing attendance data and you want to combine the attendance entries, you can just check the box to combine those entries. If you want to allow negative lead balances, so you're loading absence data and you want to allow them to go into a negative, you can check that box. And then your payment uh, pay account to charge, just like classic, you can you decide. Do we want okay? We're we're doing we're uploading attendance data. Do we want the account that are charged to be uh, the, the accounts that we have set up for the employee, the pay accounts we have set up for the employee, the substitute, or do we want to charge the account that um, the, the teacher that they're subbing for, so the sub for SSN account. Once you do that, you just click your import option, and then when you do the import option, you're going to get an ATT error report just like you do in Classic. And the error report will actually look like a spreadsheet. So if there's 
any records that did not load, those will be on the error report. And to the right, there's going to be an error telling you why it didn't record. So maybe maybe you had duplicate dates or something on there. So maybe a date needs to be changed. You could go into that ATT error CSV file, change that date, save that file. You don't have to worry about the error that's on the right. That can stay on there. You're going to save that file. Then you can go back into this program and then choose your file, which is your ATT error, your CSV file. And then you can do an import. Then it should load the error, the error report that you've been corrected to. So it's similar to classic where you'll get like a um, rejected or, you know, rejected import where you can make changes to that CSV and that way it only contains the errors that you need to fix and then you can actually upload that information. So again, very similar to classic, but it just, it's so much easier in the redesign, easier to use. Um, another core option is the bank account. Now, this is something we don't have in Classic, but the bank account information is just pretty much the district bank account information. Now, you'll notice we already have a default bank account set up. So if the district doesn't put anything else in, it'll just use that um, as the bank account. But maybe the district uses multiple bank accounts. Maybe they use one bank account for when they process uh, payroll checks for employees, and they use another bank account when they process deduction check for, for payroll items. So if they needed to, they could go in here and they could create a second bank account or a third bank account. They could just put the bank account number as number two, and then let's just say we're gonna do Huntington. Oops, maybe I can type. And then if I want to put a beginning and ending date, I could. Um, maybe you're getting, maybe they're not going to be using another, uh, the other bank. They could put it a stop date when that bank is no longer going to be used. But if they want this to be their default account, they're going to go ahead and mark this default account box, and then they need to click the save option. And the save box is probably something that is going to become your best friend because if you don't click the save box, and you go out and you'll say, well, I know I added that record. It's not going to be there. So you got to remember to click save. That's probably the uh, number one thing that people have problems with. They forget to click the save box. And so now you'll see that I have a Huntington bank account in here as well. And you'll see that this is the default because this is my default bank account. This this little box here where it says make default is is not bolded. And if I go back in and edit, or just to edit this, I can see this is my default account. If I look at the, the one that just says default bank account, that default box is going to be unchecked, and it is. So now Huntington is my default bank. The next thing we're going to talk about is, I'm going to skip. I'm going to go down to position. Because in Classic, we have the job screen, which is like where we put all the job information for the employee. In, in design, we have what we call position. So it, it kind of is more like it has all of the position information for the employee, the job information, but we have a compensation record where we actually, that's the actual job for the, that employee. So you can see here, this is the position screen. So you'll have to create the position screen. Let me go back to the create option so you can kind of see what it looks like. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So if we go to create, you can see that, let's just say I'm going to go create a new job for Dalton Workman. Okay, he's got a couple jobs already, but I have to create a new job for him. I'm just going to go in or new position, I should call it, not job, position. So here it is, here's my new position record. Now, you'll notice on here, and you'll notice on a lot of screens, we have to the right, we have what's called a save as template. In classic, we had this, um, you could use it like on the bio screen, 
the deduction screen where you could have all ones records created with just certain data populated already so you don't have to go and populate it again. You could do the same thing in here, but you could create multiple template records. So like maybe we're creating a, a position for like a bus driver, okay? We could create that position, maybe you have full-time bus drivers and part-time bus drivers. You could create templates for full-time bus driver, part-time bus driver, and then when you have those templates created, you can you choose use this choose template option and all of those those templates would be out there. So I'll just show you how to create a template. So I'm going to create just a, a template for Dalton here. Um, position we're going to do bus driver part time. Okay, and the job status will just make it active. Um, the pay group, you can select your pay group, whatever they're supposed to be in. Appointment type will choose classified. Now, the nice thing about this, I guess it's nice in a way, but sometimes it's not. You know how in classic we validate a lot of the fields? In here we don't. So like I could just basically leave everything else the way it is. I don't have a position code or anything in. I could click the template, save this template, and it would save it. But maybe I want to put the position code because I want that to be on all my te the template record. So let me find, let me see if they have us. I don't think they do. Mm, let's see. Um, I don't know what the bus driving code is, but we'll find something similar. No. <laughs> Not a nutritional. Oh, let's see. Now we'll just choose this for now. Okay, so we want to go ahead and we want to create the template record. So I'm going to do a save as template. And you'll see it tells me I can save template as. And then I'm going to type, I want to make this bus driver part-time. And then I'm going to save it. Okay, so now I should be able to go to that template option. And you can see my bus driver part-time is there. Now, let's just say that I have Dalton's record. I have to add a little bit more, you know, personal information. I could do that, like maybe his start date, his hire date. I could enter his hire date in. And then once I got have all the information that I want for him, I have to make sure I save his record. So I'm saving Dalton's record now. So I did that. So now Dalton has a record. Now he has a position nine record, okay? Because he has a position nine record, he's also going to need a position nine compensation record, which is actually going to be what is used to pay him. Because they, if I can get rid of this, I click on the X here and get rid of it. Oh, come on. Okay, there we go. So if we go in, I'm just going to show you like what a position record looks like because once you go into it, you can see down here, like right here to this area, now we see compensations. So the position record is going to contain all of the information that we just created. Plus, it, when we create the, a compensation record, it's going to include that on this record, as well as any payroll accounts that we create for this position. And so you can see compensation-wise, he has um, multiple compensations because he has one maybe from last year and the year before. So every contract that he had is going to be listed on there. Where in Classic, once you have a job record, that job record, you work, they work that job for the fiscal year, and then they purge in a new new job. That obviously the old job is saved out in history, but you don't see it on the screen. Here you'll actually be seeing those old compensation records. All right, so now let me go back in and I'll show you the, the core. And we'll go back to the compensation record now. All right, so we created a position nine for Dalton Workman. So 
what I want to do is I want to create a, a contract compensation for him because, well, maybe I want to create a non-contract. Non-contract, non I guess, would be more like your, your supplemental uh, coaches, you know, play directors, things like that. I want to create a contract compensation for this position nine for Dalton Workman because he actually he has a, a contract over you know X amount of pay and he works X amount of days. So I'm going to go in to the contract compensation tab, and here it will allow me then to do a create where I can create this compensation record for Dalton Workman. Again, this is the, the pay information for the job. So I, again, I have to find the employee, which is Dalton Workman. We're going to go ahead and pull him in. And I want to do this for his position nine. That's the one we just created. And then we're going, you can see the compensation type. The contract, it's, it's grayed out. It's because we already chose that on that contract compensation tab. We're going to go ahead and click the continue option. When I do that, then it's going to bring up a compensation record. So then I can go in and put in a description of his position. So I'm going to put bus driver part time. I put a label. Labels are nice when you run like uh, reports and things like that. Sometimes you know use labels. So you could put in maybe bus for a label. And then I want to put in a compensation start date. So maybe he's starting today. And then a compensation end date. Maybe he finishes in May. Got to choose the pay plan. And then the pay unit, hourly or daily. And then you'll see here on this compensation record, we have this override unit amount calculation box. If for some reason the district wants to override what the system calculates as their unit amount or their paper period, they can do that simply by changing that unit amount and then clicking that overwrite box if they wanted to. And I'm just going to go ahead and put in the retirement hours. Um, it's not a supplemental position. The contract work days should automatically get calculated based on the job calendar that I'm putting him on. And here we can select all different job calendars. I'm just going to put him on this job calendar. Hours and day. And then his paper period will get calculated once the system calculates based on the, the calendar start and stop dates. Again, we have this override paper period we could use. We got to enter in the contract amount. And then obligation. Oops, I put too many zeros in there. I did. And then we can use we could tap into contract type if we, if we wanted to. That's just like a a district field that they want to use. You know, one year, three year, five year. Um, how many pays are in this contract? We're going to say there's only six pays left. Uh, the pays paid obviously will get populated during the payrolls. Retro next pay, again, you could populate that if you need to, but we don't need to. We're creating a new compensation. Is this a stretch pay job? If it is, we're going to mark the stretch pay box. All of these feed, all these fields will get populated during the payroll when it's processed. Uh, we don't have the salary schedule program anymore in the redesign because of the ease of, of using importing spreadsheets for that. But we do have the salary schedule, the column, the ID, and the step. If a district still wants to use that to keep track for some reason, they can do that. Um, is the job reportable to EMIS or the compensation reportable to EMIS? I forgot to, oops. And then down here, I'm going to put in my calendar start date. My calendar end date, 5.30, oops, forgot the, <laughs> the 03 here, okay, whoops. And you'll notice it, it gives me like, a, it puts it in red, it's saying, hey, I don't like that date you put in there. 
And then you'll notice down here we have like compensation adjustments. So if you want to create an adjustment for this compensation, you could do that by clicking this create option. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just click the save button. When I do that, it automatically calculates his unit amount and his pay per period, just like Classic does when you're creating a job record. Now, you'll notice if we go back to that position record, that compensation that we just added is going to be in there on his job nine record. We'll go back to it and I'll show you. And we'll look at his position nine. And you'll be able to see down here, now he has a compensation record where before he didn't. All right? So now we're going to go back to the core. We'll go back and this time we will look at, we're going to skip, we're going to go back to pay account because we want to complete Dalton, we want to finish him. So I'm going to go in here and if I do a create for Dalton, Come on. There he is. Okay. I'm going to choose the position nine. I'm going to continue on. Now, the thing a little different with the redesign compared to classic. In classic, you could go out and you could create pay accounts. Pay accounts that are basically, you know, they had obviously they should be in use as. But in here, it does not allow you to create pay accounts. You basically have to choose an expenditure account that you want this person paid out of. And that expenditure account, all of those accounts come from USAS, okay? And so what we're going to do, we're going to click on the Add option. We're going to go in, and we have to choose the expenditure account that we want to pay, the, pay Dalton out of. I can click the drop down, and you'll see, like, there's a ton of accounts. If I know, like, what the account starts with, like, know, if I know it's a 01, 1100, 5110, I could go in, I could start typing 001, 1100, whoops, I put a three, five. And you'll notice how it narrows down my search. Then I, I can easily go in and find the correct account. Obviously, these are supply accounts. I'll just use this one. I don't care for now. So I, I have to choose the account from that drop down. Once I get it narrowed down, the status is active. What percentage? It automatically defaults to 100 unless I want to change that. If I want to change it, I would just go ahead and do that here. If there's a minimum, or I'm sorry, if there's a maximum, just like classic, I would put in the dollar amount, the maximum dollar amount. If there's a particular start date, and stop date, I could put that information, in, especially like if you're entering in like grant accounts, you would put that information in here. Is this an employer distribution account? You would check the box if it is. Uh, is it a leave projection account? If it is, you would check the box. If not, you wouldn't check it. There's a sorting order. So like if you have multiple accounts and you wanted this to sort, you know, this to be like the first one, the first account, you could set that up to do by putting in a one, and then if you had another account, you could put two, et cetera. And then once I have all my information in, I'm gonna go ahead and click the Save option. When I do that, then I should be able to go in, again, to his position record, and I'll see that now the, or the, the position record now has the full, all the position information, the compensation information, and the account information all on the screen. Okay, so let me go back to his position nine. Now you can see the compensation information, and then you've got your payroll account information. 
and you're saying to yourself, oh my gosh, this is so complicated, so crazy. We In Classic, we have that browse screen where we can go in and, you know, we create the bio screen and then we do all these other records. You can do that in here. What we have, what is called the dashboard. And to use the dashboard, you just go over here. The first thing is you do have to create an employee record. We really haven't talked about that yet. So let me go back here. We'll go back to core and we'll go to the employee record. So what you would have to do, let's just say you have a new employee. You have to create an employee record first in order to be able to use the dashboard to pretty much add everything else. So I'm gonna go in and create a new employee. Um, let me just add a few things here. And you'll notice here, again, you can create template records for employee records. Like maybe you want to create a single and married and you can, you, it's endless because you could create multiple template records if you want to. Um, let's just go down here. We'll do married and eligible for retirement and email deposit, report to EMIS. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and save the template, and then we'll do married, EMIS, direct deposit. Okay, I'm going to save that template. And then again, like I said, for anything more uh, personalized for this employee, like date of birth, things like that, I could go in. Um, and add that information. Whoops. Or that it didn't look right. It did not look right. Wasn't. Yeah, it is. Okay. Once I've got all the information, the personalized information for the employee in, I'll click the save option because that way I'm saving my record, my my employee record. All right. Once I have the employee record created, then I can go out to this dashboard, which is right here, and I can find that new employee that I just added. And you'll notice now, this is kind of like more like browse screening classic, where I could go in to positions, and then I could go in here and I can create a new position record. I can create compensation record, leaves, pay distributions, uh, attendance, payroll items, payroll accounts. So it's, again, similar to classic, where you're actually, it allows you to go screen by screen to actually cre do cre new employee information. Much easier than trying to go from the core and trying to remember, oh, I got to create this. Oh, I got to create that. It makes it a lot easier. And you'll notice on the dashboard also, we have a little area here where you can actually import a file with pictures. So you could actually have the employee's picture right on the screen as well. And then anytime an employee has been paid, so let me go back to the dashboard for Dalton Workman, because I know he's been paid. Anytime the employee's been paid, just like Browse Screening Classic, where you can actually see their payment information, you could go over on the dashboard under Payments, and you can actually pull up all of the payment information for that particular employee. Now, if I wanted to see the information, we and this is pretty much on any screen, we have what's called like a highlight screen. If I just click on this record, you can see at the, at the top, this blue line, the dark blue line is going. So it's going to pull up this highlight screen. And this gives me all the information for that particular pay. You know, the pay date, the payment transactions, uh, the positions paid. It gives me all the pay information. It gives me all the accounts that were charged, and then all the payroll item or the deduction information on this screen. So again, it's similar to classic browse screen for you can look uh, at a particular check, to see information on a particular check. Um, let's go back to the core. We're going to go now to what we call date codes. And this we do have in classic on the payroll CD. We have date codes where you could actually go in and create codes 
um, that you could put on the employee or the bioscreen record. So a lot of districts maybe use it for like putting in, um, you know, their security check or their fingerprinting uh, date. You can use date codes for that. So we could actually go in and create a date code and we'll call it uh, fingerprinting. And then this is going to go on the employee date uh, sorry, employee date. Let me just do this. Let's just let's just change it. I want to create a whole new group. I'm going to call it uh, um, custom dates. And then the property name is just going to be fingerprinting. And the property name basically is what the, what's the name going to look like on the employee record? It's going to be fingerprinting. Oops, I forgot the T up here. Okay, and then the group is going to be a separate group name on the employee record. So if I go ahead and if I click save, you can see on, on the grid of the date codes, I have this fingerprinting field, the fingerprinting. So now if I go in to this employee record, and we'll just look at any employee. You should be able to see there's a there right whoop where are you where are you? I mean there it is. The custom dates group that I just created is at the bottom. And it's gonna allow me to go in. I could go in here now and enter in a date and put a comment in if I wanted to for the fingerprinting. And then I would just save that record. If I wanted to, I could have put that date under um, let's see, where, where are some other dates on this, uh, other groups? And one thing, when you start using this, I do this a lot because it's so hard. There's so many fields on the, on the screens, and I'm like, where is, you know, the marital status or where is, you know, a certain date? I want to just find marital status quickly. If I do a control F, it pops up a box. And then I could just type in the word dates. And then it tells me there's two occurrences of dates. So if I go up, it tells me there's, there's a dates group. You can see it, date. So I could have actually, when I created that date code, that custom date code, I could have put it here under this, this employee dates group, but I created my own group. And so, but like I said, when you first start out with using the redesign and you're in a certain screen, this feature is going to be really helpful to find certain fields because marital status, I want to find just the, the word marital. Or maybe I want to find the word status. Right here's marital, there's only one occurrence and it took me right to it. If I wanted to find anything with ODJFS, I could just type in ODJFS. And it tells me there's three occurrences and all of them are highlighted. So again, when you first start out, this is probably going to be really helpful for you to use. Um, let me go out of here. We'll go back to core again. Um, the EMIS entry options. Um, we have the uh, EMIS employee entry. We have EMIS position entry, and this is basically just for like, um, if you have like an EMIS coordinator, they may have be granted a role or access just to these particular screens, so they can only make changes to these particular fields. So we do, again, it's, we have the employee record, or which is like the bio screen, dem screening classic. We have the position record, which is like the job screen, position screening classic. We have the EMIS contracted services, which is the CC record, the contractor record. But you'll notice on here, we have, your, there's also CJ records, which some districts you sometimes have. In order to turn on that service, you can go to the system configuration. And, whoops, I went to the wrong one. I went, got to go to modules. And there's an EMIS contractor module. If I click on that plus button, you can see it's telling me that a change has been made. So if I refresh my screen, and if I go back 
to the core and then go back to that EMIS entry screen, I'm going to see another tab on there, an EMIS contract is C, contractor CJ option. So again, if, if a district, a lot of times we don't include the CJ, we don't have it on there because a lot of districts don't have CJ records. But if your district does have CJ records, then you're going to want to have that feature turned on. So this is where, again, your EMIS coordinator may be able to go in and add the information for CJ records, or if that's the responsibility of the payroll person, they would have that role and be able to go in and do that. Um, we have, again, we've talked about employee a little bit. I'll just kind of show you the screen one more time just so you can kind of look at it. And again, the employee record is similar to the bio screen and dem screen in Classic. So it has a lot of the information that's on both of those screens in here. And you do have the capability of creating a template. We talked about that. We have an employee personnel record. Um, this would be for employees that basically only can do modifications and maybe view employee records. You don't want to have, have them to have any kind of deleting option at all. And then there are only some fields that they can actually go in and make changes to or make additions to. Um, so they're kind of limited. They don't have access to everything on that employee record, only certain fields. The job calendar, again, just like we have in Classic, we have job calendars. Um, so when you do your import of the calendars, everything will be imported in. Then we have the capability. You can actually go in and create new calendars by clicking the Create option. So let's just say we don't have a calendar on here. We have to create a new one. Here's where we're going to actually be doing that. We're going to be putting in the, the calendar type, um, you know, in a description. So whatever the name is of the calendar, you put that in, description, and then you can actually put your day, work days on it. Um, what I'm going to do is, let's just say we already have our calendars out there, okay? We have to create new calendars for 19 and 1920, all right? So I could go in to like this DMB calendar and create a calendar for next year. So what I can do is my DNB calendar is up. I could go in and put a start date of like 8, maybe they start on the 13th, and then they end on, let's say, May uh, 20th of 20, all right? What I can do is I'm going to tell it, first of all, I want to go in and I want to put in work days for all these days, everything between 8.13 of 19 through 5.20 of 20. I'm going to put work days. I don't want to include weekends. I could if I wanted to, but I don't want to. But if I wanted to, I could just check this box, okay? Once I do that, I'm going to click this mass add option. When I click the mass add option, I should be able to go in and see, oh, it's not done yet. <laughs> Sorry, I got impatient. I can tell it's not done because see this blue line up here, this dark blue line? That means that it's working. It's doing its thing. While we're talking about, we're waiting on that, you can see something that we that is added, which is really a nice feature, is this little this little box, this little grid box. And it actually tells you for this calendar how many days are work days are in the fiscal year, how many holidays. How many are in the calendar year? How many are in the first quarter? Um, how many are in the particular month? And then you could also set a custom date range, which I think is really helpful, especially if you have an employee like who left mid-year, and maybe you you got you want to calculate out some you know their their pay. You could go in and enter the the custom start date and the custom stop date, and then it will actually tell you how many days are actually within that range. Come on. Let me, let me go out. I probably got it all messed up when I clicked the, the button. <laughs> Cancel 
see if I can cancel it. All right. All right. So if I go back into that DME calendar, <clears throat> I don't know if anything I created for August or not. No, it didn't. Okay. Let me try it again. Let me just do May 2019. We'll just do to the end of the year. Workdays are going to mass update. This worked earlier. It was being a little temperamental. But what we can basically do is we can create, just like we do in Classic, we create one calendar. Then you can go in and tweak it. Okay, so my calendar is created. But let's just say that I want to go in and put some holidays in. So maybe um, 1221 through 1231 are, whoops, okay. let's just say that those are holidays. I'm going to go ahead and pass update that. Okay, oh, <laughs> probably because I have some whack out, whacked out date format in there. Let's try this again. Okay. Okay, let's try mass updating it now. I think it's like that better. Okay, so I could go now, if I go over to December, I should be able to see my holidays got added in. There they are. Okay. Now, okay, I got my calendar all created. I like it. Everything looks good. I got to remember, okay, I did mass, at, mass update a couple times, but in order for this calendar to be created, I have to go out and click the save option. Once I do that, <clears throat> okay, my calendar is out there. Then I have the capability of going in and copying it, just like we do in Classic. I could go in and I want to copy the DMV calendar from 820 of 19 through 1231 of 19. And I want to copy it to everybody, all the cal all my all my calendars. So in order for me to do that, I could double click each one. If I wanted to, I could click one and click the right arrow, or if I wanted to do them all, I could click the first one, scroll down, hold the shift button and click the last one. Whoops, it didn't work. Hold on, I didn't click it. I like I, I clicked the first one, scroll down to the bottom, sh hit the shift key, click that last one, and all of them get highlighted. Then all I have to do is click that right arrow. Now all I have to do is click the copy feature, and it's going to copy all of those that that DMB calendar to all of these calendars, just like it does in Classic. And then once all of those calendars are created. I can actually go in and tweak them, like you know, just like we would in classic. You know, maybe your your, uh, your custodians work more, more days during the the Christmas break than than your teachers do, and et cetera. So you could actually go in and do that, make make those calendars. Now, if I needed to make a change, maybe we had calamity days. I could go in and click this mass change feature, and maybe um, on Monday, let's just say. March 25th, we had a calamity day. And who, which calendars does this affect? I could go in and just select certain ones, or again, I could just select all of them. <coughs> Move them all over, and then click the save option. Okay, now, if I go back, I should be able to go in and see March 25th is marked as a calamity day, and it is. Very nice. Now, another feature, too, you can go into the individual calendar. So let's just say I'm in this DMB calendar, and I wanted to change the 21st. I could go in, right-click, and make this a calamity day, 
and then just click Save option up here. If I if there was something that you want to do to just a particular calendar, you can do that. So this is it's a really nice feature. And like I said, this up here is super nice because it's giving you all the dates. Instead of like when you go out to calendar maintenance, you're going from month to month if you had to count up all the days for you know, from maybe from August through January. You'd have to, you know, count each day, work days, and et cetera. This here actually does that for you. So this is a really nice, nice feature. Um, under core, another option that we're going to look at is the leaves option. And this is just like your Ben screen in Classic, your benefit record. Um, it's going to have your sick leave, vacation leave, personal leave. So you could create a new one if you had a new employee or, like I said, under the dashboard, this option is available. I'll just go ahead and pull this up so you can look at the records, see what they look like. <clears throat> Again, we have sick and personal, so this employee must not qualify for vacation. And all of, all of uh, these, these fields are basically pending on the position record because that position record, just like in classic on the job screen, it has the eligibility, that has the eligibility flags, whether they're eligible for uh, sick or personal or vacation. <clears throat> Um, another feature on here, on the, you'll notice we have two tabs. We have a leaves tab, which is what we just looked at. We also have an accumulations tab. So maybe you have a new employee that comes in. Maybe you automatically give them like three days of sick leave or something automatically. Okay, to do that, and we used to just go into attendance screen in Classic and, and do an accumulation of three days for, of sick leave. Again, since we don't do that in a tenant screen in the redesign anymore, we're going to be doing it through this accumulation tab under the leaves option. So if I click the create button, I can go in, I'll find that new employee that I just added. Um, you know what, I don't know if I clicked, I didn't. Ah! All right, let me go back because I didn't, give myself any leave when I created my, I didn't create a position record, so that's why. I just created the employee record, so let me quickly go in and do this. Oh my, it's almost going on four o'clock. Okay, we're gonna do this, so we're gonna go right to the payroll process because we have, I mean, I could go on and on and on, <laughs> and you guys would get sick of it real quick. Um, let me just go in here. Just do a one, and here's the eligibility flag that I was talking about. That is active. All right, so I can create that position record. Nope, I didn't select the pay group. I didn't like that. All right. All right, so if I go back to that leaves option, I could do that accumulation. And I could add an accumulation for that new employee under the accumulation screen because now I have the leaves selected. Okay, let's just go, let's go to the organization. Again, that's just like in USAS. It's all the district information. It has like the, uh, the SCRS uh, ID, the SCRS code, ODJFS number, state EIN, and federal EIN. Uh, pay distributions, pay distributions and redesign is kind of like your uh, deduction screen in, in uh, I know how to say this, in classic, I want to say. Like whether they're going to be paid through a direct deposit, whether they're going to be paid through a check. But in classic, if it was a direct deposit, they had a 700 uh, deduction. Now in, in the redesign, you have the capability, if you want, you can actually go in and they could have part of it go to a direct deposit, part of it go to a check. Uh, a lot of people are saying, yeah, don't even tell them that that's an option, but it is an option just so you know. But they have the capability of going in and adding a pay distribution 
then they would have to choose whether it's going to be a direct deposit or a check. If it's a direct deposit, they have to make sure that they populate the information. And you'll notice everything that's in red, you got to make sure you have that information in. And you want to make sure you have the, like your ACH destination and ACH source because that information all it gets included when you're doing your direct deposit information. So you want to make sure all of that is populated as well. Um, let me go, let me look here. We have pay groups. Again, that's just like we have in Classic. So if you have new pay groups, you could add those through the Create option. We have payee. Now, payee is a little, <laughs> It's like half of your uh, uh, pay your pay dead, like your uh, pay dead record in in classic, because you're actually having to create a, a, a payee who you, who where you're actually going to be sending the money. In order to do that, um, you're going to be putting like the address information in, whether it's in a uh, you know, the, the name, the address information, whether it's an electronic payment or not, um, phone number and all that information. Again, that's just like when you go into Classic, you're looking at the um, USB Con screen, and this is part of that screen. So this is your payee information, because this is going to be used on what we call the payroll item configuration screen, which is the other half of the dead name record, the employee, you know, where, where you're going to be sending the money. But the, the, pay, the payroll item configuration screen is more of the down and dirty information regarding the, the, pay, the, the payroll item. So let's just say that's for a regular deduction. You'd have to go and select your type create the deduction, or the, any more they're not deductions, they're payroll items, but I keep calling them deductions. And here, like I said, you'd have to put in your code, the name, your pay cycle, um, abbreviation, your W-2 abbreviation. If you have, if it's a board paid uh, payroll item, you'd put in your object codes. But then down here, this is where your payee information comes into play, because you'd have to go in and select which payee it's going to. So again, usually you have to create the payee information first and then create the payroll item configuration. But it's possible the payee information might already be out there. Maybe it's an American Fidelity and, uh, payee, and you could already have that information in. You don't have to duplicate it because you already have one record in there. Um, one more thing we'll talk about here. Uh, the payroll item, that's just like your dead screen for your employees, the dead screen records, similar to that. Um, and then our last thing is posting periods and position personnel. Position personnel is just like employee personnel. There's only certain fields that employees can see and they only have the modify and view uh, option. And then posting periods, just like uh, in USAS, you, we have posting periods. And in order to be able to start a pro, uh, to actually process a payroll, your that posting period has to be in a current period. So right now my my current period is March. If I'm finished with March, but maybe there's some things I want to do in March, I could go in and create April and make that my current payroll, my current processing period. And then to do that, I just choose the month. And then I go until I want that to be my current posting period. And you'll notice in the right hand side it changes to April as my as my current posting period. But March is still open, but it's not my current period. So now in order for me to process payroll, what I do is we have current and future, just like we do in classic. If I have future like time slips that I wanted to enter in. I could actually go into future. I clicked under the payroll tab. I clicked the future option. Oh, there it is. Okay. And let's just say I wanted to create, I wanted to add some time slip information. Okay. Just like in USAS, we have this create new and, and close option. So let's just say I have an employee that has four different time slips. Okay. I want to enter them in separately. I don't want to combine them. I'm going to go and do this create view. I would find the employee, enter the information. 
once I do that and I could click save, but it keeps the screen open so that same employee is pulled up. Okay, once I'm done with that employee, I can click this X to exit out. So it's similar to USAS. If you leave that create new, it just stays in that, that same box and then you can just select that particular employee and create the information. Once I'm done, I'm gonna close. If I wanted to just, like, I, like Michelle had said earlier, if you wanna create only one record, you could just click that close once you're done and then it will just close that box out. Or you could click the X, either one, it doesn't matter. But again, our future information is just like it is in Classic. You can add information. You could even run a report right from here if you wanted to. Uh, from the report menu, that grid option. Um, so once we've gotten that done, we could go into the payroll, under payroll, the payroll processing tab. And you'll see here we have an in progress and we have a posted option. I'm just gonna go ahead and initialize a new payroll is what I'm gonna do. And then it gives me the option to put in a payroll description. So maybe I'll just put April 1st pay. Oh, well, April 1st payroll. Okay, we have to select the pay group or the pay cycle, not pay group, sorry. Okay, and then our, our payment plan pay cycle, we have to choose that. Have to put in my beginning date, my ending date, and then my pay date. And again, I can type these in manually or I could use the calendar to do that. Then over here, you can see all of these, all of these pay groups are selected. Let's just say there's certain ones that I don't want to include. Maybe I'll just get rid of some of these, some of these pay groups. Anything that I double click, you'll notice it goes over to the available option. I'm just gonna, these are the only ones I wanna process right now. And we do have the, the capability of doing it additions. So like if you have different uh, period beginning and ending dates, but it's for the same payroll, you can do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna initialize this payroll. And then you'll see I have this little uh, indicator is a, and it tells me that it's in process, it's processing the payroll. And then down here, it's telling all the different pay groups the status of all the pay groups. When it's totally finished processing, this indicator is going to be green, which it is. Okay. Now, if for some reason I needed to make a change to something, I could go in and click this modify button. And then maybe I made a change. If I made a change to like somebody's uh, compensation record, I would have to go in and modify hit modify and then modify that particular pay group and click the update payroll option. And then it's just gonna go back in and then it's just gonna reprocess. And you, again, you'll see that indicator spinning and it's gonna go ahead and, and process that. Once it's done, again, I should get that green indicator light, which I did. Now, if I wanted to do an addition, I could click this add pay group option. If I click that add pay group option, it allows me to go in, I could select these other pay groups, pull them over, and then put in a particular beginning and ending date and click add pay group. And then that will process and it will actually, again, have the indicator will be spinning and it'll include those pay groups in my pay. Now I've got my pay report, so I double click on that. I'm gonna go ahead and say I wanna process that. <clears throat> And you can see we have these options to begin a new employee on each employee on a new page, include the employer payroll items and the amount. So that's like, do I want to include the board distribution amount on the report? So this is kind of like when you run CalcPay, you're basically pulling that in. Do I only want to show report totals? Um, I can sort it however I want. If I wanted to sort it by ID, last name, there's just a lot of different sorting options on here. Um, I'll just go ahead and sort it by last name for now. I'm going to go ahead and generate the report. And then again, so as I use Chrome, it's asking me where, hey, where do you want to save this report? I'm saving it to my downloads. 
It's going to save that report, and you'll see once it's finished, there's like a blue box or blue circle around it, but now it's finished. I can go ahead and open that report. When I open it, it tells me all the different pay groups. I have all my information, my setup information at the beginning of the report. And then down here, it looks just like our pay report in class. It gives you the pay information, which, you know, which positions, all the payroll items or deductions, and the accounts that were charged. And then at the bottom of the report, it's going to give you totals. Let me go down to the bottom here, maybe. And one thing that um, we do have had people ask us, I know right now in Classic on the pay report, there, usually there's totals. I think they use this for some sort of reporting. It'll give them like total females. Um, there's another total too that they need. Um, right now we don't have that option on here, but we are going to be getting that on here. That's an actual option that we will include. But this gives us, you know, the total number, the reports are very like um, the total gross, pretty much just like you, you see on your pay report, how many employees were paid, all the pay type totals, gives us every, all the information, all the, all the payroll item information. So once I'm ha if I'm happy with this, I can go in and then I could just go in here and you'll notice there's also an error report. So if there were errors, like if this circle was red, that means that I have a fatal error of some nature on my error report. So if I go ahead and look at my error report, there could be some errors on there, but they could just possibly be like informs or just warnings where it doesn't stop. So yeah, this one just says accrued pay amount is greater than the remaining total accrued. That's not anything that I'm really too worried about. Um, so. I could go in now, you can see here all these other reports that got created. We've got a payroll item detail report, and that pay, pay, <clears throat> payroll item deep, ugh, I can't talk. <laughs> the payroll item detail report is uh, similar, let me pull it up here, that would be like your dead detail, deduction detail report in Classic. You could actually go in and you could select which deductions or payroll items you wanted to look at and generate the report and it would show you all that information. I'll just go ahead and just, I'll just pull in everything. It doesn't take that long. I just pull it over and then I'm going to go ahead and generate it. And again, it tells me all the items I pulled in, and then it, it gives me a, a detail of each payroll item. So like I've got my, my federal tax, my state tax, et cetera. All of that pulls in. Then we've got, got the budget distribution report, which is like the budget report. If I go ahead and click generate on that, it just generates the budget distribution report. Not a whole lot of setup on that one. I just go ahead and click generate and it generates it. Gives me a total on the at the bottom of the budget information. Then we've got the payroll account distribution report. <clears throat> go ahead and create that one. And this is just all, more of a detailed payroll, this payroll item distribution. Okay, so I've looked at all of these preliminary reports. At this point, I'm ready. I'm, I'm liking everything I see. Everything looks good. So all I have to do is post the payroll. So really, you're eliminating a lot of steps. Like in Classic, you're doing I&I, &I, Calc, Calc, Pay, you know, check print, check update. When I click this post payroll option, this is pretty much like my check update. I'm going and I'm going and saying I want to post this. Now, when I post this, I'm not posting anything to USAS yet. I'm just posting this as in, in payroll as my payroll is being completed. So like check update. And again, you can see the indicator is circling and when that's finished it's going to be green. It should be green. That means it's completed. 
<clears throat> and sometimes this takes a few more minutes because there's a lot of data that's getting pulled in. All the account information, all the pay information. Okay, so now you can see we have some other different reports. We have the same pay report, the same error report, but we have a post error report. So if there was errors on this, there might be, uh, this would be red, and we have to look at this post error report to see what the fatal error is. We have the budget distribution report created. If I go in now and generate this, this report is going to be the one that, let me pull it up here and I can show you. This is the report that the treasurer signs. So you could save that report, print it off, and have the treasurer sign it. Or if you wanted to, you could you know, save it and then email it to the treasurer, however you want to do it. Then we have the pay account distribution report. Again, that's similar to what we saw earlier, except now we've actually processed everything. It's all been processed. <coughs> we'll go ahead and create this again. And again, it looks, like I said, it looks pretty much the same as, as the initial report that we did earlier. If for some reason something was wrong, and let's just say there was a problem and I didn't like the way something worked or something, something uh, was charged, I would have the capability of going in and unposting the payroll. I'm not getting rid of anything, I'm just unposting it. So I could go in and click this unpost option. And when I do that, it's basically taking me back where I could go in and maybe change somebody's pay account and then um, then modify it, update it, and then repost it. I have the capability of doing that. Where in Classic, you kind of don't, like usually check update was the point of no return. I mean, unless you had the ITC actually go in and back you up from a save pay. Um, then we have the, pro the process payments option. This would be if you uh, create checks, you would go in and, and create your checks or your direct deposit. If you do paper direct deposits, you create those uh, using either the XML format, which is probably what you're going to be using for like ABM, ABS, or EDGE. And then the bank account, you can see that it defaults to that Huntington bank account and then you can sort it however you wanted to. The starting check number should automatically default to the next available payroll starting check number. And then the file name, so if I chose XML, it automatically puts a checks XML file name in. So if I click process payments, it's going to go ahead and process those payments, and it's going to give me a file uh, that I actually will take this checks file save it out to my desktop or wherever, and then upload it to my check printing software. I can do that. Now, we do have the capability, I didn't turn them on, I should have done this, but we have the capability of doing email direct deposit notices, and I should have turned that on before I, I didn't think about doing it. But um, let me go back to modules. We have the capability of doing that. Yeah, let me just turn these on. And we also have the option of doing employer, like board distribution or board RET. We have those capabilities as well. And we have something called USAS integration module. So pretty much this works with USAS. If you remember like it, when Michelle had her screen pulled up, there was a USPS integration. Now you can see we have a USAS integration option. Let me go back here. I wanna just check something and see if this will let me go to that posted payroll since I turned on those, that email. It does. Okay, so our email notices option, this will do your email direct deposit notices. You click on that, and this actually, I could do all, all my email direct deposit notices. The nice feature with this is if we have a payroll that maybe was, you know, from a month ago, and somebody said, I need my email direct deposit from, you know, January 1st. You actually could go in and find the employees. So what you do, you would select all the employees here, move them over to the available, and then let's just say we wanted, um, we're going to pick on Dalton Workman again. He's our, he's our pick on person. 
if I can find him here. Oh, maybe. Oh, there he is. Okay. So I pull him over. What I can do, this is just like in class when you run either get, you could go in here and set a particular date that you want this to process and a particular time you want this to process. So if I go in, I told this I wanted to process this at four, oh, I'll just change the time. What's going to happen is um, it will actually go out to that job scheduler. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, another thing we have the capability of doing is we have a direct deposit form. Right now we have a, just a default version here, but you, your district has the capability of actually creating like a custom direct deposit form. Like you could use like a, like this default, the standard, and you have the capability of like putting your district logo on that um, or maybe adding other something else onto the direct deposit if you want to. So it's really a nice feature. And you would find, like, um, if you would create a custom, you'd look, you'd click on this down arrow, and that custom option would actually be there. I'll show you how you import that in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and click the schedule setting. And so it's going to put this, this job out in the job scheduler. I better hurry because I put 407. Ah, I might not be able to see it because it's 407 right now. Uh, let's see. Yeah, right here it is. You can see I have a, this set to, to, to process at 4.07 today, this payroll April 1st. So that direct deposit notice that I'm going to send out for Dal Dalton Workman is scheduled in this, in this uh, job scheduler. So again, like if you were scheduling it, like a lot of times when you use Eater Deb, you schedule it to process maybe like at 2 o'clock in the morning on Friday morning or whatever. So you would put that information in and then that would, job would just sit out here until that time and then it would actually process. Um, I'll show you where you can actually go in and, and add, you know, the uh, custom direct, uh, direct deposit notice information if you wanted to. So remember we went to report, like Michelle was in reports earlier, this report manager. We could go in, you could create this form, the form how you wanted it. We have certain characters, I mean, your ITC will probably have to help you with this because it's a little complex. But once the form is created, you could actually go to this create form option. And when you do that, you would go in and put the, the name of the report. So maybe it'd be like custom direct deposit notice or whatever. So I'm just going to put custom direct deposit notice. And then the description, I'll just put direct deposit notice. Maybe I want to put a tag on it. I'll put a direct deposit notice tag. The entity type, I would go in because this is a payroll direct deposit notice. I have to go out and find that. And then I have to select my form file. So I could go in here. I do have a form file. Let me go out and find it. Oh, let's see, where is it? Just use the standard. And then I'm going to go ahead and select the form. Oops, I already did that. What am I doing? <laughs> okay. Once I've selected the form, I'm going to go ahead and click the Save option. And when I do that, you'll notice now that that, that custom direct deposit notice is in my report. But if I would go back to my direct deposit, so let me go back to the posted payroll and pull that up. If I go back to that email notice, I should now see that custom direct deposit notice that I put out there under here. And it is custom direct deposit notice. So that's a really nice feature and you can create your own. And like I said, you can set it up to process later or you can process it now however you want to do it. Um, we also have the capability of processing board distribution, board dis or uh, board ret for your retirement. Um, Normally, we have, under the USAS integration, we have this account synchronization, and that normally is a process that runs every night by itself. And the only reason a district would have to run it on their own would be if uh, USAS had created a new expenditure account 
that day and you're going to be using it that day, you'd have to go in and just hit that account synchronization to get the two programs to work together. Um, if I wanted to go in to be like do a board distribution, this employer distribution submission option, pretty much like board dis, you, you'd enter in your pay date, your beginning pay date, your ending pay date. You would select the particular uh, payroll item or deductions that you want to process through. And once you do that, uh, let me see, what did I do? Three, did I do 19? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember the pay date. Oh, I know I've got one for 18. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do 18. 18, we'll do 18. Now, I'm probably going to get an error just for the, the fact that these files are um, an anonymized and the data in here is not real good. They actually, these pay expenditure accounts have some uh, some really strange data in them. Yeah, see all these errors I'm getting? It's because of these these characters, these alpha characters that are in there. But in reality, if your accounts are all synchronized, they work. You should not get that error, and then you would see this pull up. It's like a sub, uh, submission preview. And it shows you exactly, you know, which payee and then how much um, is being paid. Once everything is correct, you're, if it's correct, you go in and click the Submit to USAS option. And then when you did that, you would see that process up here under the uh, Employer Distribution Submissions. And then we also have a, the Board Red option, which is your retirement share. And again, it's kind of the same as Board uh, similar to that employer distribution you're putting in your dates, but you have to put in your amounts to dis, dis, distribute for your STRS and SCRS, and then you'll do a show submission preview, and then when you do that, then you would actually get this, this submission, submit employer share of retirement to USAS tab would be un, ungrayed, and you could click that, and again, you would see that same option up here under the employer share of retirement submission because that um, file is sitting out in use has to be processed. Um, we have a test connection option under there, and a lot of times we recommend that districts, once they're you know importing the data and they get all of their accounts set up and everything synchronized, that they run this test this test configuration, and there's a security configuration as well. The ITCs are uh, more concerned with that because they have to set this up in USAS and on the payroll side in order for the two programs to work together. Um, under utilities, we have an account mapping feature, <clears throat> which is just like mapping in Classic. Um, you could go in and add mapping, you know, from the original account to a mapped account. If you have mapping in Classic, it will import it in automatically. Um, we talked about the attendance absence import. We also have um, an automatic payment reconciliation configuration, which is basically like your pay rec and your positive pay rec. It's the, the setup information, that would be where you do your setup information in here. And then we process it, use that under the payments option. Um, I know I'm over my time. <laughs> Do you want me to stop? Because I went through the payroll process itself. I mean, there's a lot of th other things that we can go over, but um, I know we're, we're 15 minutes over. Brian, do you want me to just stop and take questions at this point? Yeah, I was going to say, we have some people that were starting to walk out, so. I just yeah, I figured, up. that's what I figured. <laughs> I, I figured probably better, <laughs> I, I better ring it off. So, I mean, do, are there any questions at all? Do you upload any payroll data? Yes. Like yes. For, there's a there's a mass add option right here under utility, the mass load option. So yes, you can. You can mass load uh, pretty much anything. If I if I go out to mass load, whoops, I clicked the wrong thing. Go out to mass load. There we go. You'd have to choose your file that you're loading, and then here are all the different entities where you can load data. So yeah, you can definitely load information in for sure. Any other questions? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I could I could 
go on and on, <laughs> which I usually do, but um, that's just kind of like a, you know, especially the payroll process, I wanted to give you a little little bit of a demo of, of how that worked. So oh, we appreciate um, I don't have anything. I, yeah, we appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. And um, if you have any questions, let us know. So Yeah, I'll follow up with any questions that somebody might give me afterwards. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, if you if you could just send them to us, that'd be perfect. So, right. appreciate well, your time and too. yep. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, you too. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.